Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, on with our story time. Night of the Living Dead. Exterior Cemetery Dusk. It is an ordinary dusk of normal quiet and shadow. The gray sky contains a soft glow from the recent sun, so that trees and long blades of grass seem to shimmer in the gathering night. There is a rasp of crickets and the rustle of leaves and an occasional whispering breeze. Transitions are easy and gradual, with relaxed studies of earth, grass, and leafy branches on a high mounded hill. Revelation of cemetery markers has nothing to disrupt the peacefulness of our established mood. When awareness comes, it is almost as though we have known where we were all alone. We are in a typical rural cemetery, conceivably adjacent to a small church. Although the presence of a church is rather felt and confirmed. The stones range from small, identifying slates to monuments of careful design. An occasional Franciscan crucifix or a carved image of a defending angel. Over a hundred years of death indicated in the stones, syllabic, with their year on the status the families they represent. Over the other night sounds is added the gravel rumble of a slow-moving car. A wider shot reveals the car and the mounded cemetery. As the car pulls into the gate and moves down one of the cemetery roads, the car passes in extreme foreground and moves away from the camera and the breeze of its passing dead leaves that clutter the little road swirl and move. Beyond the distant trees, the last receding gray of dusk is surrendering to the black. The car continues. When the car stops, we feel the absence of its sound, replaced by the crickets and the subtle wind. Even as the car is still rocking slightly from its stopping action, we cut to a shot through the driver window at the occupants of the car. The driver is a young man in his mid-twenties, and his passenger is a young woman, his sister. The man is in shirt sleeves with a loosened tie. His suit coat is on the clothing hook over the back seat. The girl is wearing a simple but attractive summer suit. The jacket is removed and folded onto her lap. She is fussing with her purse, while the man shuts off the engine, lights, and leans back to yawn and stretch his legs. The girl closes a potato chip bag, brushes crumbs, muffs her hair. Typical feminine gestures after a long ride. The man stretches again. Barbara spoke. They ought to make the day. Time changes the first day of summer, and two good things would happen all at once. A little laugh echoed from the man as he straightened his tie. Barbara said again, I love the long days and the extra sun. John replied, A lot of good the extra daylight does me. I lost an hour's sleep, and it's already dark and we still have a three-hour drive, and we won't get back until after midnight. Barbara reached down to put her shoes on. If it really dragged you that much, you wouldn't do it. John replied, Are you kidding? I certainly don't want to blow Sunday on this scene. We're going to either have to move Mother to Parkville or move the grave to Pittsburgh. Barbara replied, Oh, you're just being silly. Mother can't make a drive like this. John reached to the back seat 
produced a flowered, cross-shaped grave ornament. In the center of the cross, in gold script on a red field, it is written, We shall remember. Look, he said, Twenty-five dollars. We still remember. I don't. You know it. I don't remember what the guy looks like. John, it takes you five minutes. John shook his head. Three hours. No, six hours. Six hours and five minutes, Barbara. Barbara continued to primp and straighten her outfit. John handed her the grave ornament and leaned forward to struggle into a suit jacket. Other ones to remember, he said. So we have to drive 400 miles to plant a cross on a grave. As if he's staring up through the ground to check out the decorations. He pointed at the cross inscription. We have to remember. And she stays at home. Johnny, said Barbara. We're here, all right? She opened her door and turned to step out. John took the keys from the ignition and dropped them into his pocket. Hey, hey Barbara, you know the radio's been on this whole time. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice announced, please forgive. What? Hey, you could have signaled Charlie. John stared at the radio. It must have been the station. There was a bustle of sound, and then static, and John clicked the radio off. He got out of the car and walked around the front of it, trotting to catch up with his sister. It was obvious that she didn't hear him. He caught up to her and started to repeat his discovery about the radio. Hey, the radio, it's okay, he said, it's just... But Barbara was more interested in finding the row containing their father's grave. You remember which row it's in, she asked. Momentarily forgetting the radio, John replied. Oh, it's, it's over here, I think. They began to walk in a suggested direction. John asked, Did you hear the radio, Barbara? Looking ahead, trying to spot the grave, Barbara nodded. The radio's fixed, said John. Must have been the station and not the radio. Barbara was still searching intently for the grave. But it won't be as strange driving home then, she said. They continue walking through the row of gravestones in the growing darkness. There's nobody around, said John, attempting to make conversation. Well, it is late, replied Barbara. If you'd get up a little earlier, John. Now wait, said John. I already lost an hour's sleep on the dime change. Barbara replied. Oh, sometimes I think you complain just to hear yourself talk. An hour earlier, said John, and it'd still be light. He squinted into the darkness. The grave's hard enough to find in the light. There it is, Barbara pointed. They moved toward a grave with a standard rectangular stone. It is an unkempt grave. Its outline cropped and overgrown with grass and wilted flowers. John took the flowered cross and, stepping close to the headstone, embedded its wire prong base into the earth. He rambled on. Wonder what happened to the one from last year. Every year, twenty-five bucks for one of these things, and the one from last year is always gone. The flowers die, she responded, watching John as he built up some dirt around the base of the ornament. The caretaker or someone must take everything away. John stood up, brushed himself off. Yeah, a little spit and polish, and they can sell them again. I wonder how many times we bought the same. But he didn't finish. And standing, he saw his sister with a pair of rosary beads. She was praying silently, looking down at the ground. John straightened his tie and buttons on his jacket. He stepped behind his sister, put his hands into his pockets, and rocked nervously on one foot. 
she continued to pray. John looked around the cemetery. The stones are soft and white. They seem very pale. There are a few moving shadows. The sounds of the night seem louder. But this is only because they have stopped talking. The situation does not seem ominous. John is simply bored. In the distance, a huddled figure is walking among the graves. John glanced at his watch. Come on, Barb. Church was this morning. But Barbara continued her prayers. John lit a cigarette, idly exhaling the first puff of smoke, and began to look around again. The huddled figure was still moving slowly among the graves. John turned to his sister and was almost about to say something, but he saw her making the sign of the cross and dropping her beads into her purse. She turned from the grave, and they both started to walk slowly away. John felt slightly uncomfortable about urging her to leave. Well, I mean, prayings for church. I haven't seen you in church lately, responded Barbara. Well, said John, Grandpa told me I was damned to hell. He said this lightly, looking ahead to a large tree. He smiled. Do you remember, right here, I jumped out at you from behind that tree. Grandpa got so excited. And you'll be damned to hell, he shouted. Barbara smiled. Right here, said John. I jumped out from behind that tree at you. Barbara expressed annoyance. You used to be scared here, Barbara. Stop, John, replied Barbara. John laughed playfully. See, you're still afraid. No, stop it, said Barbara. I mean it. John mocked. They're going to get you, Barbara. Stop it, she said. You're being stupid. John replied. They're coming for you, Barbara. They're going to get you. He leered at her playfully, as though about to bounce. Barbara felt herself becoming nervous. Johnny, stop. But John continued to mock, now ominously. They're coming out of their graves. After you. They're coming to get you. With this. John threw up his arms and his voice began to rise. The figure moving among the graves stopped and stood for a moment, still. Barbara glanced towards the figure and momentarily her anxiety turned to embarrassment. You're acting like an idiot, John, she said. John spoke in a lower tone now, glancing at the figure as they draw closer in their perpendicular paths. John's remarks are now directed to Barbara, as though he didn't want the old man to hear. Here comes one of them now, he whispered. Barbara walked faster. Johnny, he'll hear you. He's coming to get you, Barbara. Barbara pursed her lips together in anger. The pair is now only a few yards from intersection with their path and the old figure. John, his whisper now, mocked, but somewhat panicky. I'm getting out of here. And suddenly he bolted and ran away up the path. John, wait, said Barbara. Embarrassed, she cuts herself short from conversation and continued to walk, more rapidly now. Up the path, beyond the intersection of the man's row, John stopped, laughing, and turned to look back at his sister. She is near the place where the paths meet. So is the old man. Barbara is looking down in embarrassed silence, aware of her proximity to the old man. She feigns poise, and as she makes the intersection, looks up nervously to deliver a socially necessary smile to the old mourner. The old man lunged at her. His hand grabbed at her hair. A frightened gasp. As he choked her, she is coughing. The man gripped her arm and slashed at her clothing. She flails about, 
trying to yell as she choked. John was horrified. Hey, stop. But the man is all over Barbara, unable to hold her in her violent flailing. His grabbing tore her jacket, and he scratched her face. He seemed to be trying to bite her arm. John leapt at the man. Three fall to the ground, Barbara kicking and beating with her purse. John gets a firm hold on the man, and Barbara is able to wrench free. The man thrashed wildly at all parts of John's body. He struggled to their feet. The man thrashed, beat, and tore about like an animal. John clutched at him and they fall into a heap. In the darkness, their form is as one as they thrash together. Barbara screamed wildly. The two men made animal sounds as they fought. One figure gains the advantage and slammed his fist down against the other's head. Barbara is panic-stricken. Her screams turn to frenzied gaps as she finds a tree limb and attempted to climb up it. But when she looks up, she sees that one has vanquished the other. She stopped in her tracks. Night sound. A close shot of the group makes him clear that John is lying limply on the ground. The other man is hunched over his form. The man is doing something with the limp body, still ripping at it. Perhaps he was groping for money, but Barbara cannot tell. John, she moaned. The old man froze and looked up. The girl raised her club and rushed towards him. He jumped into a half-standing position, like an animal hunched to spring. Barbara stopped in her tracks. The man was breathing heavily. She started to back away. The man held very still. She backed further, faster, now in total fear. The man started to move slowly, cat-like stepped over the body. Barbara dropped the club and broke into a dead run down the path. She screamed in terror. The man moved after her, but he's considerably slower than she was. He seemed to have difficulty moving. He appeared almost crippled. In a flailing run, Barbara reached the car, sobbing. She yanked open the door. She could hear the man drawing nearer. She scrambled into the front seat and slammed the door shut. There was no key. The man drew nearer, seeming to move faster, more desperate to reach the girl. Barbara sobbed. She clenched the steering wheel. The driver's window was open, and she struggled to roll it up. Then she pressed the lock button. The man was upon the car. Barbara dove across the seat to slam down the passenger side lock. The man ripped at the door handles and pounded violently at the car. Barbara started screaming again. The man kept pounding, clawing. He grabbed a stone from the road. The passenger window shattered into thousands of little cracks. Another pound by the man sends a stone through the window. His hands grabbed through the opening to peel away the flakes of glass in sections. Barbara's screams are horrified, violent. She summoned enough presence of mind to reach for the emergency brake. The man pounded and flailed at the window. The car, at the top of a long grade, slowly starts to drift. The man struggled to keep his hold struggled to rip out the glass. His arm broke through. His sleeve is ripped and tattered. His hand grabbed at the inside of the door. The car is moving faster now. The man struggled to cling. He is forced to trot after the car. Faster. He lost his footing. Grabs at the fender. The bumper. He fell hitting the road hard. The car gained momentum. 
The man regains his footing and starts after the car again, as it moves faster and faster. Barbara sits frozen in the driver's seat, clenching at the wheel. The road ahead is black. The speed is now brightening. She pulled the light switch. The headlights danced beams of light among the trees. Beams revealed the crate in the road, which is narrowing to a one-car width. And, about 200 feet ahead, the downhill crate ends and an uphill crate begins. In desperation, Barbara looked out the rear window. Against the sky, in the light from the cemetery gate, the man was still coming after them. In panic, she looked around. She was still in the cemetery proper. Rows of graves on both sides of the road. No lights from houses. No signs of life. The car began to slow. Its momentum carried it some distance up the upgrade. Barbara glanced backward. The man is moving faster towards her. She is terrified. The car reached a full stop. There was increased panic in her face. She began to forget herself. And the car began to drift backward towards the man as he draws nearer. The car picked up momentum, carrying her towards her pursuer. She grabbed at the emergency brake and yanked it tight. The lurch of the car threw her against the seat. She struggled with the door handle. The button popped up. The man drew nearer. She makes a break from the car. But the man keeps coming, desperately trying to move faster. Barbara ran off the roadway and onto the turf of the cemetery. She fell. She kicked her shoes off. She gets up and keeps running. The man is still after her. She reaches a low stone wall which marks the end of the cemetery. She struggles over it and looks ahead for a moment to get her bearings. Across the main highway is a darkened gasoline station. Beyond it, an old house. She panted heavily, glanced up and down the driveway. But there was no sign of traffic. The man was nearing the low cemetery wall. She broke into a run across the highway. The gasoline station showed no sign of life. It was old and decrepit. One light was out over the pumps. The pump house and surroundings are nearly lost in shadow. Some fifty yards away, there is an old house. Barbara ran towards it. She pressed against the side of the house. In a darkened corner, trying to look up into the window. Across the highway, she saw her pursuer struggle over the little wall. And in his clumsiness, he fell, groveling on the ground. Now in full panic, she ran to the rear of the house and into the shadows of a small back porch. Her first impulse was to cry out for help, but she silenced herself in favor of trying to stay hidden. She gasped, trying to hold her breath. Silent. Night sound and the sounds of the man's running footsteps slowing to a trot, and then a walk, and then the footsteps stopped. Barbara quickly glanced about. There was a rear window. She peered through it, but inside everything was dark. Pursuing footsteps took up again. She pressed back against the door of the house, and her hand fell on the doorknob. She looked down at it, grabbed it with a turn, and the door opened. She entered quickly, as quietly as possible, and closed the door softly behind her. She bolted it and felt around in the darkness for a key. Her hand found a skeleton key, and she turned it, making a small rasp and a click. 
She leaned against the door, listening. She could still hear the distant footfalls. Barbara realized that she was in the kitchen, an old house. She groped through a door and into a large living room. There was no sign of life. Her impulse was to cry out for help. But again she stopped herself, for fear of being heard by the man outside. She darted back to the kitchen, rummaging through drawers in a kitchen cabinet. She found silverware. She chose a large steak knife and, grasping it tightly, went to listen at the door again. All is quiet. She went back into the living room. Beyond it was an alcove that contained the front entrance to the house. She rushed to the front door and made sure it was locked. Cautiously, she pushed back the corner of the curtain to see outside. The view overlooked an expanse of lawn, large shadowy pine trees, and the service station across the road. There was no sign of her attacker. Suddenly, there was a noise from outside, the pounding and rattling of the door. Barbara dropped the curtain edge and stiffened. More sounds. She hurried to a side window. Across the lawn, the man was pounding at the door to the garage. She watched, her eyes wide with fear. The man struggled with the door, then looked about and picked up something, a smash at it. In panic, Barbara pulled away from the window. Noticed across the room was a telephone. She rushed to it and picked up the receiver. Dial tone. She frantically dialed the operator. There were buzzes, clicks, and then a voice. I'm sorry, our lines are busy. Would you hold the line, please? I'm sorry, our lines are busy. Would you hold the line? Barbara quickly depressed the receiver buttons. She let them up and dialed again. A long pause. She could hear sounds from the gas station. The voice again. I'm sorry, our lines are busy. Would you hold the line, please? I'm sorry. She depressed the buttons again. Dialed 411 for information. Another long pause. Then the rasping sound of a busy signal. The noises from the service station have stopped now. She listened for a moment. Then she shuddered with fear. She noticed a telephone directory in a stand near the phone. Frantically, her fingers searched the pages for the emergency numbers. Police. She dialed shakily. But before she had dialed the last numbers, the raspiness of the busy signal came over the receiver once again. She depressed the buttons. Footsteps. She put the phone down and rushed to another window. A figure was crossing the lawn coming towards the house. It is a different figure, a different man. She ran to the door and peered out through the curtains again. The man was still walking towards the house. A shadow darkened a strip of window at the left of the door. Its abruptness startled her. She peeled back a corner of the curtain and saw the back of the first attacker not ten feet away. He was facing the man who was approaching. The attacker moved toward the new man. Barbara froze against the door, glancing down at her knife. She looked back out towards the two men. They joined each other under the dark, hanging tree, and they stood looking back towards the cemetery. From inside the house, Barbara squinted, trying to see... Finally, the attacker moved back across the road in the direction of the cemetery. The other man approached the house, saw the shadows of a tree, 
and stop. He had an attitude of stolid watching. Barbara stared. She can see little of what he is doing. She lunged towards the phone again. She dialed the operator. The same recorded message. She barely stopped herself from slamming down the receiver. Then suddenly, there was a distant sound. An approaching car. She scampered to the window and looked out. The road seemed empty. But after a moment, faint light appeared, bouncing and rapidly approaching. The car was coming up the road. Barbara reached for the doorknob and edged the door open very slightly. The light spilled dimly over the area. There, under the great tree in the lawn, was a silhouette of the second man. Barbara shuddered. She was afraid to make her break for the approaching car. The figure appeared to be sitting quite still, its head and shoulders slumped over seemed to be looking right at the house. The car sped by. Barbara just stared at the figure. She could not run. She closed the door and back into the shadows of the house. She turned in panic, looking all around her. Dark, dreary rooms were very quiet, cast in shadow. She spied a stairway and ran towards it, still carrying the knife. She is panting and frantic as she climbed. Her hands grazed the banister. As she reached the floor of the second landing, she saw a glimpse of something on the floor there. She continued to climb until she was upon it. The corpse. Mara stopped. The corpse was almost skeletal with its flesh ripped from it, and it lied at the end of a trail of blood. She screamed in absolute horror. Barbara almost fell back down the stairs. She started gagging. She made a break for the door, unlocked it, flung herself out into the night, completely unmindful of consequences. She was bathed in light. As two headlights came screeching towards her, and the sounds of a vehicle stopping, Barbara covered her face with her arms as someone rushed towards her. It was a man. He asked, Are you one of them? She stared at him, frozen. He was just a man. He was large and crude, wearing coveralls and a tattered orca shirt. He looked very strong, and perhaps a little stupid. Behind him was an old, battered pickup truck. He has driven this right up on the lawn, right to the house. He held a large jack handle in his hand, and he stood there panting. Behind him, the man at the tree still standing, silently. Barbara remained frozen as he spoke again. Ma'am, are you one of them? I seen them. They look like you. The man at the tree moved forward. Barbara screamed and stepped back. The truck driver spun to face the other man. The other man stopped in his tracks. The truck driver jumped back, protectively towards the girl, while the others stood, just watching. Finally, truck driver seized Barbara's wrist and pulled her into the house, slamming the door behind them. Barbara fell back against the wall. The truck driver locked the door and threw across the bolt. He was breathing hard. He turned to look at Barbara. She brought the knife up, defensively. His voice came quieter now, soothingly almost as he would address a scared rabbit. All right. It's all right now. She stared wildly at him. He immediately concerned himself with his surrounding. 
moved into the next room to check the windows. He tried a lamp. It lit. And he turned it back off. Barbara weakly lowered her knife and fell to a sitting position in a chair. She watched the man intently. He called to her from the other room. Ma'am, don't you mind the creep outside? I can handle him. There's probably going to be lots more of them. As soon as they find out about us. But I'm out of gas. The pumps over there are locked. Is there food here? We'll get us some grub, okay? And we beat them off. And it's good at all. Barbara just stared at him. He responded. It isn't any good, anyway. Might as well have two tin cans and a string. You live here. She remained silent, looking towards the top of the stairs. The man followed her eyes and started towards the stairs. Halfway up, he saw the corpse and stopped. Oh no, he said. He stared for a moment, and then slowly backed down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, he looked at Barbara, shivering with shock in her chair. Then he forced himself back into action. We have to bust out of here, okay? Get to where there's some folk. Somebody with guns or something. He quickly moved towards the kitchen. I'll try to find us some grub. He entered the kitchen and started to rummage. He flung open the refrigerator and the cupboards. Finding a stack of large paper grocery bag, he opens one and started to fill it. Everything from the refrigerator that he could grab. He hurled the stuff into the bag. He is interrupted by Barbara's voice. Wait, sir, what's happening? He looked up at her. She repeated, What's happening? She shook her head in fright and bewilderment. The truck driver looked at her. She stood like a frightened child in the kitchen doorway. He was amazed at her question. A shattering crash startled them. The man dropped the groceries and seized his drag handle. He ran to the front door and looked out in the curtained window. Another shattering sound. The first attacker has joined the second man at the old pickup truck. Both have large sticks and are smashing out the headlights. The truck driver looked back at her. There's two of them. Once the lights were battered out, the two men outside started to beat at the body of the truck. The truck driver spun and lunged towards Barbara. Ma'am, how many? How many? She backed further away, but the truck driver lunged again, this time in desperation to make her understand. Ma'am, how many? Come on now. I know you're scared. But I can handle them, too. Now how many more is out there? A truck is our only chance to get out of here. How many? Tell me how many. He grabbed her shoulders. And she struggled against him. Thrashing now. Hysterical. I don't know, she said. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. She broke into hysterical sobbing. The truck driver spun away from her and made a run for the door. He looked out the window for just a moment. The attackers were still beating on the truck, wildly trying to tear it apart. The truck driver flung open the door and left off the porch. The two men looked up. For the first time, Barbara saw the faces of the attackers. They were dead things. The flesh on their face was rotting and oozing. Their eyes bulged from deep socket. Their hair was long. Their clothing rotten and in tatters. They were ghoulish beings staring up at the truck driver. 
He started for them slowly, with building vengeance. He moved steadily at first, with controlled power. He spoke as he advanced, clutching his jack handle. Come on, get it. Come on, come get some of my jack handle. He concentrated his attack, moving stolidly towards the two creatures. He broke almost into a run, but the two, rather than backing off, moved towards the man, as though drawn by some urge. The man pounded into them, swinging and thrashing with arms and jack handle. They are buffeted back by his blows. They seem weak compared to him, but his powerful blows don't really stop them. It is like beating a rug. He flings them back, and they advance again. It is a violent, brutal struggle. The big man finally beats the two into the ground, and for a great while continues to pound at their limp forms. He broke, almost sobbing, with each of his blows. He beat at them, and beat at them, as Barbara watched in shock from the porch. He thrashed and beat until she started to scream again. Her screams pierced the night. The man stopped. Breathing heavily, he stood, enveloped in the quiet of the night. Barbara stood in the doorway, and the truck driver turned to face her, out of breath. Suddenly, the noise behind Barbara caused her to spin. Walking towards her from the kitchen was another of the hideous creatures. The truck driver leapt towards the thing. Lock that door. Barbara slammed the door and locked it, backing against it as another equally brutal struggle ensues in the living room. The big man again beats the attacker down, but another has appeared at the kitchen door. The truck driver leapt towards it, and with powerful jack handle blows, drove it out beyond the door so that he could fall against it, shutting it, bolting it. He stood, leaning against the frame, and trying to breathe. There was a long silence. The truck driver just stared down at the floor, and he said, They know we're in here now. There ain't no disputing that. Outside the house, the fourth ghoul stands staring at the back door. Another slowly walked up behind it, and another. At the front of the house, Three more stood near the bodies of the first two. Barbara spun towards the front door, her face twitching in fright. Her eyes are wide. She has a non-blinking stare. As she spun, her eyes caught on the floor where the dead humanoid lied. The thing is askew on its back. Its right arm extended towards Barbara. Its fingers twisted as though to grab. There was a slight movement in the thing's hand. It twitched. Its whole body twitched slightly. Bent, broken neck of the being twisted upward in an open mouth, glassy stare. Barbara stepped towards the thing. The fear in her face bore the beginnings of a sick frown. The hand twitched again. Barbara moved closer, drawn towards it, staring down at it, with overpowering curiosity. The thing was something dead, with the beginnings of decay on its face and neck. Barbara moved closer. The thing started twitching again. She was staring right down into the thing's eyes. Her hands came up to her mouth. She felt the urge to be ill, scream to run. These urges must be fought. The glassy stare from the bulging eyes, looking right back up at her. The thing was starting to stand, 
suddenly, with a rustling sound, the thing moved. The truck driver was there, holding on to the thing's legs, dragging it across the floor. Shut your eyes, girl. I'm getting this dead, the opera, out of here. He was sweating. His face showed anger and anguish as he dragged the body across the floor. Barbara just stood there, her hands still at her mouth, watching. The sounds of the man's breathing and his struggle filled the room. With the body, he reached the back door and let the legs fall. What a filthy, he said. The stark light on the big man's face made him shine with sweat. His eyes were alert and afraid. He turned quickly to see through the small window panes in the door. Outside, lurking in shadow from the huge trees, three beings watched and waited, their arms dangling and eyes bulging. And they stared at the big truck driver's activity. With a swift move, the truck driver unbolted the door and flung it open and bent towards the inert thing at his feet. Ghoulish things began to move towards him. With one great heave, dead form was flopped outside the door and lied across the threshold. The things advanced silently. Another great effort, and the body was almost clear. From inside the house, the truck driver's efforts could not be clearly seen by Barbara because the door frame was blocking her view. She moved into the kitchen. The truck driver flopped the body down onto the edge of the porch. Three figures were close upon him now, all starting to reach out. The truck driver shuddered. He fumbled into the breast pocket of his work shirt. Things advanced. He produced a pack of matches, managing to strike one, and touched the burning tip of the clothing of the dead thing. With almost a popping sound, the clothing caught fire. Creatures in the yard stopped in their tracks. The fire blazed slowly. Shaking, the truck driver touched the match to other aspects of the thing's clothing. His fingers burned, and he snapped them, throwing the match into the heaped form. He was breathing hard, standing. He kicked the burning creature off the edge of the porch. He watched it roll down three small steps onto the grass, lying still, flames licking around it. The three creatures stepped back slightly. The truck driver clung to the banister around the little porch. His fists were clenched, and his face was fiery in the glow of the flames. His voice quivered. I'll get you. I'm going to get you. All of you. All of you. He stood defiantly on the little porch. The flaming corpse separated him from the things that waited. He spun suddenly. Barbara stood inside the kitchen door. His face was a fury of sweat, quivering anger. His eyes met hers. She stepped slowly back into the room. Truck driver, in great strides, re-entered the kitchen and slammed the door, bolting it again. His breathing was loud and more rapid than before. His eyes darted quickly around the room in search of something. He rushed to the cabinets and threw them open, began rummaging through them, standard kitchen utensils and supplies. He did not speak. He frantically ransacked. Then he turned to her. See if you can find the light switch. Barbara fell back against a wall, and her hand groped 
to a switch. The light from an overhead fixture came on, providing dim illumination. The truck driver continued to clatter about, frantically. The light coming on made Barbara blink. She remained against the wall, her hand still touching the switch. It was as though she dared not move. She watched him silently. The truck driver flung open drawers and spilled contents onto the shelving and onto the floor. His hands fell into the silverware drawer, still open from when Barbara first discovered it. He rooted through it, pulling out a large knife and sucking his breath in, stuffed it under his belt. Then he reached into the drawer again and produced another knife. Taking Barbara by surprise, he strode towards her. He shoved the knife at her, handle first, but she fell back slightly. Her action stayed his franticness. Breathing heavily through his words, he spoke. Now, you hang on to this, girl. She hesitated, but she took the knife. He seemed weak, almost apathetic, as though she were losing control of herself. She stared at the weapon in her hand, and her eyes came up to meet the man's intense face. He pulled away from her and continued to rummage, but he spoke periodically now, between great breath and between the brief times when his interest is wrapped in something he finds in his rummaging. His search is not without control. It has a coordinated purpose. It is selective, although frantic and desperate. He looks for nails and strips of wood or planks that he might nail around doors and windows. His actions are hurry and intent after these defensive ends. At first, his search has his full attention. Gradually, as he moves about and begins to come up with several key items that he needs, his efforts pace down into a more deliberate flow. He starts putting up boards and tables against the vulnerable parts of the old house. His mood relaxes in intensity, becomes calmer, more analytical. The barricading instills a feeling of greater security and the knowledge of some security begins to overtake Barbara as well, bringing her out of her shock and passivity. The scene proceeds as follows. Barbara looks at her knife, recedes against the wall. The noise of the search is ever-present. The man mutters occasionally and spills his findings about the room. At first, as new cabinets and drawers fail to turn up what he is looking for. He grows impatient and more violent. Spools of thread, buttons, manicure implements, shoe shine materials, another drawer. Immediately, as the drawers flung open with a clatter, the drug driver sees what he needs. He almost leaps into the drawer. His big hand comes out of the drawer with an old pipe tobacco tin, and in one gesture, he spills its contents onto a shelf, nails and screws and washers and tacks all spill out onto the wooden shelf. If you roll too far and clatter onto the floor, his fingers scoop them up. He fumbled through the little pile of things and selected the longest nails. In the back, he stuffed them into his breast pocket. Even as he stuffed the nails into his pocket, he is already moving, his eyes searching for his next need. He turned to Barbara. See if there's any wood around the fireplace out there. His hands explore the shelf surface. Barbara does not respond immediately. His impetus carries him towards another shelf. 
But in turning, he notices that Barbara is still standing there, still motionless. Look, girl. His voice is angry at first, but he stopped himself. Then he spoke still frantically, but with less harshness. You're scared. I'm scared. I'm scared too. Just like you now. He composed himself even more. We ain't gonna be worth a bug nickel if we don't do something, okay? I'm gonna board up these doors and windows. You gotta pitch in. We gotta help ourselves. Because there ain't nobody around to help us. We're gonna be alright, okay? Now, I want you to scamper out there and see if there's any wood in that fireplace. He stopped, still breathing hard. Barbara just looks at him. She started to move very slowly, away from the wall. Are you okay? He asked. Barbara is still for a long moment, but then nods her head weakly. Barbara left the room, and he continued his search. She moved quickly into the living room area. The darkness stopped her for an instant, slowing her pace. From the kitchen came the clattering sounds of the man's search. She looked ahead. White curtains on the windows seemed to glow, and every shadow seemed suspect. Barbara shuddered. On the table, there was a large bowl with rounded flowers. The breeze caused them to stir and sink with the sounds from the kitchen. The effect startled Barbara. She dove for a table lamp, picked it on. Mental illumination filled the room. But the room is empty. She started slowly towards the fireplace. Near it, she saw a stack of logwood and a few planks that might be large enough to nail across the windows. Still clutching her knife, she bent over the pile and gathered up the plank. She stood with her awkward load, and the foreboding room faced her again, stopping her. She bolted and hurried towards the kitchen, bursting through the door. She found the big fan pounding with his jack handle, at the hinges on a tall broom closet door. One final swipe, and a great yank freed the wooden door, and the man stood it against the wall next to the broom closet. In the recesses of the closet, the man spotted other useful items and pulled them out. An ironing board, three center boards from a dining table, and some old scrap lumber motioned for Barbara to follow as he grabbed the closet door and moved to the back door of the house, which he had previously bolted against the creatures outside. He slapped the closet door up against the paint portion of the kitchen window and found that with the same piece he could cover the entire kitchen window. He leaned against the piece of wood and groped in his pocket for nails door started to slip slightly. It does not completely cover the adjoining window, but it leaves slots of glass at the top and bottom. However, it does cover the glass part of the entrance. Barbara drops her burden and moves swiftly, helping the man by holding an end of the barrier in position. The truck driver accepts her help automatically, without recognition, and gives the barricade cursory inspection as he determined where to place his nail. Pulling several nails from his pocket, he placed them and drove them in with his jack handle. He drove two on through the door in the molding until they grabbed, then moved onto her side and drove two more. When four were in, he whacked at them with the jack handle until they were completely sunken, and he began to add more. Then he started to dock. The first decisive steps had been taken. Quite a lot of relief came with it. Most of the house was still vulnerable, but the measures taken have instilled his confidence. While he talks, though, 
He keeps working rapidly, his pace as intense as ever. He spoke. There. I saw to hamper their crimper. They can't. They're not that strong there. Two more nails in position, driven to the molding. He tested the barricading wood with two good yanks. It held. He spoke again. They ain't coming through that. He drove the last two nails in all the way. Better figure out how many more nails we have. He sees the parts of the windows that remain uncovered. I'll leave that for now, but we'll fix the rest, he said. He turned quickly from the barricade and looked around the room. No other doors or windows, except the door leading to the living room. Well, he said, this place is fairly secure. He examined planks and table extension. Now, if we have to... The barber just stood and watched him. If we have to, he continued, we just run in here. And no dragon now, or fussing with your makeup, or I leave you out there. We run in here and we board up the door. The door between the kitchen and living room has been open this whole time. The big man closed it, tested it, and shut it tight. He opened it again, quickly chose several of the lumber strips and stood them against the door frame. He groped in his pocket and noticed that a supply of nails was dwindling. He checked the pile, sprinkled from the can, he emptied the can completely and fingered the content for all the longest nails. He tossed just these back into the can. He handed the can to Barbara. You hold on to these. This time, she reacted quickly and took the tobacco tin from his big hand. As she did, the man gathered as much of the lumber as he could into his arm and started out of the room. Barbara followed. They entered the living room. It ain't going to be too long, he said. They're trying to hammer their way in here. They're afraid now. He dropped his load of wood in the middle of the floor and walked over to the largest front window, looking as he moved. They're scared of fire, too. I found that out. His eye measured the size of the big windows. He looked all around the room. Finally, his eyes fixed on the large dining table, and he moved quickly towards it, talking as he moved, resuming his train of thought. There must have been fifty... A hundred of them in Cambria when the news broke. Barbara watched, almost transfixed. At his mention of the number of the creatures, her eyes reflect amazement and frightened curiosity. The man reached the table, walked around it studying its size, and then hoisted one end and turned it onto its side, bracing it against himself. He heaved on one of the legs and tried to break it free. With a great ripping sound, the table leg was torn off, and the man dropped it onto the rug. He continued talking, punctuation of his remarks, vengeance. I seen this big old gasoline truck, you know, down Beekman's, by Beekman's diner. I had heard the radio. I got a radio in my truck. He wrenched at the second table leg. It cracked loudly but did not come free. He moved to where his jack handle was lying on the floor. This case line truck comes screaming out of the diner lot onto the road. Must be ten, fifteen of those things chasing it. And it looks funny to me. But I don't see the things running behind it right away. He picked up the jack handle and hammered at the table leg second powerful swap freed the leg. He moved on to the third. I just see this big truck, he said. And it looks funny, you know, how slow trucks will start when it's pulling out onto the road and weaving. Then I see them things and the truck's moving so slow. They're catching up, grabbing, jumping up. 
And that truck just cut right across the road. Through the guardrail, you know. I'm starting to throw on my brakes. And the truck smashes into this big sign. And into the pumps in the SO station down there. I heard this crash. And that big thing starts burning. And it's still moving. Right through the pump stand. And onto the station. And I'm stopped. Stock still. And I see those things. And they all starting to back off. Some of them running. Or at least, looks like they're running. But they move kind of like they're crippled. They keep backing off. And it's like, it's like they gotta get away from the fires. The guy driving the truck can't get out no how. He got the cab of the truck plowed halfway into the wall. Things frying him in there. And he's screaming. Screaming. Barbara's eyes widen. And her face wrinkled in anxiety. The continuing nightmare grows more and more complex. The truck driver swatted the last leg from the table. And the tabletop started to drop. He regained control of it. And though he struggled, he moved it to the next room. Barbara automatically moved to his assistance. And they walked together, each burdened by the heavy table. I don't know what's going to happen, he said. You know, I mean, I don't know. The whole place going to explode or fly to pieces. Or what's going to happen? I start driving for the gas station. And the cat in the truck is screaming. It's screaming. And after a while, he just stopped. Set down his end of the table and wiped beads of sweat from his forehead. His breathing was still heavy from his previous exertion. He wiped his hand on his shirt. His eyes were wide and angry. It almost seemed as though he were going to cry. He spoke again. There's them things standing back, across the road, standing looking like, looking like, like they just come back from the grave or something. And they're over by the diner. And there's cars and buses in the diner lot. And lots of the windows are smashed. But it's for sure them things done. People in the diner are done. And more are outside, all over the place just biding their time for a chance to move in. So I start my truck up, and I barrel it right down at some of the things. Streaming right down at him. His face grew more intense with this memory. And I get a good look at him. I see him for the first time in my lights. And then, I just run right down on him. I just grind down, down as hard as I can. I knock a couple of them about 50 feet, playing with into the air. And I just want to smash them, crush them filthy things. And they're just standing there. They ain't running. They ain't even trying to get out of the road. Some of them are even reaching out, as if they can grab me. But they're just standing there. And the drug is running them down, like they were bugs or something. Hey. Barbara stared at him wide-eyed, stared at him with disgust. Her hand still clutched at the tabletop, but she said nothing. The man saw her fear and stopped himself. He refocused his attention on the tabletop and started to lift it again. Barbara was practically motionless. As he tugged the table, her hands fell away and she slowly pulled them against herself. He dragged the table away from her, and she walked numbly behind, having forgotten to assess. She just watched the man's face. He spoke again. I'm just... I got kids, you know, and I guess they'll do all right. They can take care of themselves. But they're still only kids. And I'm being away and all. And respiring heavily, he tugged the twist of the tabletop, 
trying to fit it through the door frame into the living room. I'm just going to do what I can, he said. And I'm going to get back. And I'm going to see my people. Things are going to be all right. And I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back. He has started to babble now. He saw that Barbara was intently watching him. Then he stopped. He composed himself with some effort. His voice came more monotone now, with enforced calm. But he does, beneath his anger, seem as confident as could be expected. He spoke again. Now, you and me are going to be all right, too. You can head him things off. I mean, you can just... You can just smash them. All you gotta do is keep your head. Don't be too afraid. We move faster than they can. And they're awfully weak. And if you don't run, you just keep swinging. You can smash them. We're smarter than they are. And we're stronger than they are. We're gonna stop them, okay? Barbara just stared at him. All we gotta do, he said again, is just keep our heads. Barbara stared at him numbly. Who are they? He stopped in his track, still supporting the heavy tabletop, and looked with amazement at Barbara's anxious face. Only it dawned on him that she has never really been aware of what has been happening. She has not heard the radio announcement, bulletin. She had been existing in a state of uninformed shock. He looked at her incredulously. You ain't heard nothing? She stared blankly, silently. Her eyes fastened on it. Her replies are silent. He responded. I mean, you ain't got no idea about what's going on here. Barbara started to nod her answer. She began to tremble. Her trembling increased. She began to shake violently. And suddenly she flung up her arms and flailed them about, sobbing wildly. She began to walk in panic, wildly and aimlessly, in circles around the room. No, 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 she said. I... What's happening? What's happening to us? Why? What's happening? Tell me. Tell me. The man grabbed her, shaking her to bring her out of it. Her speech, still nearly hysterical, became a little more coherent. We were in the cemetery, she said. Me and Johnny. My brother Johnny. He brought flowers for this. And this man came after me. Johnny. Ah. Now he. The truck driver stopped her. All right. It's all right. He tightened his grip as she wrenched against him. Get your hands off me. She flung herself away from him, beating him across the chest, taking him by surprise in her momentum, she stumbled over an end table, barely regained her balance, and stood facing the front door, poised, as if to run out into the night. Barbara was panicking now. We've got to go help Johnny. We have to get Johnny. We have to find him and bring him. She walked towards the truck driver, Bleeding now in tears, the desperate tears of a frightened girl. Bring him here, she said. We'll be safe, and we can help him. The truck driver stepped towards her. She backed away, holding one hand towards him defensively, the other towards her mouth. No, no, please, she cried. You've got to took one deliberate step towards her. His voice was calming, quiet. Now you're safe here, girl. 
We can't take any chances. Baba cried. We've got to get Johnny. The truck driver shook his head. No, come on, girl. You have to settle down. I don't know what these things are. It ain't like no Sunday school out there. Barbara began sobbing violently, and her words became screams. She was verging on complete hysteria. The man struggled to calm her, and she wrenched from him, but his grip remained, so that her arms struck her whole body. She stared at the man. Her eyes met in an instant of calm, but only an instant, before she began screaming again, kicking and hitting. He struggled to pin her arms at her sides and shove her against a wall. At the same time, he does not want to hurt her. With brute force, he shoved her backward, propelling her into a soft chair. She is up again, screaming and slapping at his face. He is forced to grab her again, and practically slams her into a corner. He shook her violently, shocking her into a dumb, wounded silence. Her eyes fell sorrowfully on his, and she began to crumble. She fell limp against him as he supported her weight, easing her into his arms. Holding her, he looked about the room until his eyes fell on a sofa. He did not carry her, but helped to walk her to the sofa and helped her fold her body onto it, using her head onto a cushion. Next to the couch is a cabinet radio. The truck driver stabs at a button, flicking it on while the radio warms up. He looked around for the tin of nails and found it where Barbara had dropped it. He took nails and slid them into his pocket. The radio hissed and crackled with the static. He returned to it and searches with the tuning dial. At first, just static. Then it spins past what sounds like a voice. He adjusted it carefully, trying to find the right spot. Tuner found a metallic, monotone voice. This is the emergency radio network. Normal broadcast facilities have been temporarily discontinued. Stay tuned to this wave for emergency information. Your law enforcement agencies urge you to remain in your homes. If all doors and windows locked or boarded shut. Use all food, water, and medical supplies sparingly. Civil defense forces are attempting to gain control. Stay near your radio. Remain tuned to this frequency. Do not use your automobile. Remain in your home. Keep all doors and windows locked. Then there was a long pause and a crackle. And another recording. Our live broadcasters will convey information as received from civil defense headquarters. This is your Civil Defense Emergency Radio Network. Normal broadcast facilities have been temporarily discontinued. Stay tuned to this wavelength. The truck driver waved his hand in disgust at the repetition of the radio and moved away as it continued the announcement. He resumed his efforts with the heavy wooden tabletop. This time, he dragged it to the living room window. He leaned it against the wall and pulled back the curtain to peer outside. There were now four figures standing in the yard. The voice of the distant radio recording continued. The figures stood very still, their arms dangling, aspects of their silhouettes revealing tattered clothing and shaggy hair. They were cold, dead things. Then suddenly, from across the road, the truck driver saw a figure moving towards the house. He spun himself away from the door and rushed to the fireplace. He reached for his matches. In the stand near the couch, where Barbara lies, there are old magazines. The man grabbed them, ripped pages loose, and crumpled them into the fireplace. 
You pounded with the jack handle, driven now by desperation. Another nail, and another. The table secure, he checked it hastily, and leapt to another window, so he could peer out between its nailed up boards. The new figure is just reaching the place where the others stand silently. The man rushed to the fire, where the biggest logs have now begun to blaze. He seized the discarded table legs and saturated them with charcoal light, and he held their largest ends into the fire until he had two good flaming torches. Then, a torch in each hand, he moved towards the door again. He nudged a big padded armchair ahead of him to the door, and, taking both torches in one hand, pulled the curtain aside for another look at the yard. The figures are still standing there silently. With charcoal light, he drenched the padded armchair and touched it with a torch. It caught flame instantly. Fire licked and climbed, casting flickering light throughout the house. The heat on the man is now severe, but he fought it. He lunged for the door, unbolting it, flinging it wide open. From the yard, as the door bangs open, the flaming chair is now visible throws off an eerie, irregular illumination into the lawn. The waiting figures step back slightly. The man shoved the chair through the doorway, and it slid across the front porch. It toppled over the edge, and the flaming bolt tumbled down the steps onto the front lawn. In the rolling motion, flames lick and fly, and small particles of the chair stuffing Deep and glow in the night wind. The bonfire rages in the tall grass. Waiting figures back further away. Inside the house, the front door bangs shut. And the man fastened the bolt. He hurried again to the window, putting more nails into the tabletop and fastening it securely. He surveyed his surroundings, looking for vulnerabilities. He noticed a side window in the living room, a window in the dining room at the other side of the house, the front door, the flanking glass panels. He turned, still inspecting, and his eyes reflect surprise. Barbara is now sitting up on the couch, and her demeanor is startling. She's sitting in silence, staring at the floor as the radio drones on. Fire plays on her face and reflects in her eyes. The man took off his jacket and moved towards her. He placed his jacket carefully over her shoulders and looked sympathetically into her eyes. She stared at the floor without moving. He began to feel dumb and helpless. Forlornly, he moved to the pile of lumber, choosing a table board, and went to the side window. Radio voice continued in the background. He began boarding up the two side windows and then moved to the front door. He grabs an ironing board and places it across the door horizontally. It extended over the flanking glass panels, leaving cracks at the top and bottom. They are too small for anything to get through. He drove nails through the board into the molding and tested the barricade for strength. Finding it sufficient, he left it and went on to the next. In the dining room, there were two closed doors. He tried one, finding it locked, examined it, and found no latch. It has apparently been locked with a skeleton key. The other door was locked and led into a den, which contained several windows. He was disappointed at this added vulnerability. He stood there for a moment, thinking and left the room, shutting the door behind him. It is clear that he has decided to board up the door, rather than try and secure the big bay windows. He checked his remaining lumber. The supply was dwindling, so he selected the best piece for boarding the den door. He was about to start hammering when an idea struck him. He opened the door again and entered the room. 
There are chairs, a desk, a bureau. He walked towards the desk and started to rummage through the drawers. He pulled out paper, a stack of pencils and pens, a compass, a hundred little odds and ends, another drawer, a hundred more things. He left it open. The bureau contained mostly clothing. He ripped out the big drawers and hurled them through the doorway and into the dining area. One drawer, then two, the contents spilling onto the floor. He looked back at the bureau. A final idea struck him. He shoved the great piece of furniture through the door, walking it through the tight opening until it cleared the doorway. And the desk, which warranted another struggle. The man attempted to secure all things of possible value, for he finally nailed the door shut. In the closet, he found a lot of old clothing. He pulled out a good warm coat and jacket and flung them over his shoulder. High on the shelves were piles of old boxes, suitcases, had boxes, and an old umbrella. He looked for an instant, fading their worth for the possible worth of what they might contain. At his feet, he saw still more clutter, Boxes, umbrellas, dust, shoes, and slippers. He picked up a pair of ladies' flats and examined them, wondering if they would fit Barbara, who still lay out on the couch. As he pulled away, something caught his eye. In the dark recess of the closet, something shiny, the sheen of a finished piece of wood, a familiar shape, lying under a pile of dirty clothing. He reached eagerly, and his hand found what he had hoped for, a rifle. He set everything down, and rummaged even more eagerly all over the floor of the closet, through shoe boxes, under things. Items came flying out of the closet, a shoe box containing old letters and postcards, but in a cigar box, fluttering around old pipe cleaners and cleaning fluid. There is a maintenance manual and a box of ammunition. He flung open the box and found it half full. He shoved the manual and cartridges into his pocket and then decided to take the whole cigar box full of material. He tucked it under his arm, gathered his jackets and shoes, and left the room. In the dining room, he dropped a load of supplies on the bureau. And the sight of the girl in the living room stops him short. She is still sitting as before, not moving. He spoke to her. We're all right now. This place is good and solid, I promise. And I found us a gun, a gun and some bullets. He looked at Barbara from across the room. She doesn't seem to take any note of his talking. He turned to his work, but continued to speak. So he got us a radio, and sooner or later, somebody will come get us out of here. He began boarding up the door to the den. We have food, you know, and I found you some shoes. We'll see in a minute if they fit, and some warm clothes for you, too. He pounded at the nails. Pounding and the repetition of the radio message are the only sound last nail in. Check for sturdiness. The truck driver turned towards the girl again. Other than her upright position, Barbara shows no sign of life. Her wide eyes just stare through the floor at some point beyond. Well, we're doing what we can, he said. He can't smile, and with the girl not looking at him, his attempt is half-hearted. He takes up the rifle, the cigar box, the coat, and her shoes in one clumsy armful. He knelt with his bundle in front of Barbara, then dropped the armful of materials at her feet. He held the shoes that he found in the closet. Let's see, he said. How big are your feet? But looking up at her, he is unable to cope with her catatonia. 
Her stillness makes him as gentle as he can be. He converses with her, still expecting her to reply and react, though she does not. Come on, he said. He held up one of the shoes near her feet, waiting for her to lift her leg and slip into the shoe. She remains still. He gently takes one of her ankles and fumbles to put the shoe on her foot. It does not go on easily, partly because it is too small, but mostly because of her limpness. Still, he gets it on, sets her foot down, and takes up the other one. He succeeds in getting the second shoe on her as well. He leant back on his haunches, looking up at her. She is staring down at her feet. He joked, well, that's... That's a real Cinderella story, isn't it? But no response. He reached in reflex for his jacket pocket, but he has given Barbara his jacket. Hey, he said, you know you have my cigarettes tried to smile again, but still there is no reaction. He reaches towards her, and his hand enters the pocket of the jacket. He is draped over her shoulders. His action makes Barbara look directly at him, and her stare makes him uncomfortable. You have my cigarettes, he said. He tried a gentler tone, as one would try to explain some complex concept to a child. He pulls the cigarettes from her pocket and settled back from her again. He fumbled for a cigarette, putting it to his mouth and lighting it, trying not to look at Barbara. Her gaze is still fixed on his face. He inhaled the first puff of smoke and blew it out through his nose. Okay, now, maybe you ought to lie down, girl. He fumbled with the cigarette and a thought occurred to him, so he tried it. You smoke. He held up the burning cigarette. Her stare dropped from him back to the floor. He took another drag and blew the smoke out quickly. Maybe you, he said. He stops. He is getting nowhere. He decided that his time had better be spent securing the defenses of the house. Okay. His okay is more definite than his other talk, and he scoops up the rifle and ammunition. He examined his gun, dropping the shells onto the floor, methodically loading them one at a time. He spoke again. Now I don't know if you're hearing me or not, or if you're out or something, but I'm going upstairs now, okay? Now we're safe down here. Ain't nothing getting in here. At least not easy. I mean, they might be able to bust through that. But it's gonna be some sweat. And I would hear them. And I think I could keep them out. Later on, I'm gonna fix things good. So they can't get in no how. But it's good for the time being, okay, girl? You're okay here. He continued to load the rifle as he spoke. His cigarette dangling from his lips causing him to squint from the smoke curling around his eyes. Now the upstairs is the only other way something can get in here, okay? So I'm gonna go up and fix that, he said. He snapped the clip after the last shell and was about to stand when his glance fell on the girl again. He tried to get through her one last time. Girl, you're gonna be all right, okay? She remained silent. He stood, tucking the rifle under his arm, grabbing as much lumber as he could carry, and started for the stairs. Barbara looked up after him, and he's aware that he kept moving, and her stare follows. I'm gonna be right here, okay, he said. You're all right now. I'm right here, upstairs. He started up the stairs. At the top of the landing, he's confronted once again, the body that lies there, torn into face. He sat down his supplies, and the sight of the corpse was repulsive, though he tried not to look at it. 
The body was lying half across a blood-soaked throw rug. A few feet away was another throw rug, with oriental patterns and a fringe sewn around its edges. He grabbed the second rug and ripped away one edge of the fringe. Once the initial tear was made, the rest of the fringe peeled away easily. He freed it and, taking the rifle, tied one end of the new fringe around the barrel and the other around the narrow part of the stock. This done, he slung the rifle over his shoulder. Then he leaned over the corpse and took hold of one end of the rug and began dragging it across the floor. On the landing was a long corridor with several closed doors. He deposited the ugly load at one of the doorways and threw open the door. Inside, he found a bedroom. He tried the other doors and found two more bedrooms, one a child's. He began to remove furniture into the hallway. His plan was to afterwards board up the doors. The noise of his work begins to fill the old house. Downstairs, Barbara still sits dazed on the couch. The fire flickers on her face, and the burning wood pops loudly now and again. Objects in the room are silhouetted, and the atmosphere is dark. The radio continued. Facilities have been instructed to discontinue programming. Stay tuned to this. There was a sudden buzzing sound and crackling static, and a hodgepodge of newsroom sounds, as heard earlier by John on the car radio. Typewriters, ticker tape machines, low voices talking in the background. The sound holds for a long while. Barbara does not seem to notice. Then the voice again. Um, ladies and gentlemen. What? Yeah, yeah, um, I got that. What, another one? Put it through in a major event for 48 hours. I was no longer impressed. The latest development. His voice spoke again. Up to the minute reports inform us that the siege, first documented in the Midwestern section of the country, is indeed spread across the nation and is in fact worldwide. Medical and scientific advisors have been summoned to the White House, and reporters on the scene in Washington inform us that the President is planning to make public the results of the conference. This will address the nation over your civil defense emergency network. There was a long pause by the announcer, but Barbara remained inert. He began again. The strange beings that have appeared in most parts of the nation seem to have certain predictable patterns of behavior. In the few hours following initial reports of violence and death, and apparently deranged attacks on the lives of people, it has taken us completely off guard. But it has been established that the alien beings are human in many physical and behavioral aspects. Hypotheses as to their origin and their aims have to this point been so varied and so diverse that we must only report these factors to be unknown. Teams of scientists and physicians presently have the corpses of several of the aggressors, and these corpses are being studied for clues that might negate or confirm existing theories. The most overwhelming fact is that these beings are infiltrating through urban and rural areas throughout the nation. They are coming in forces of varying number, and if they have not as yet evidenced themselves in your area, please take every available precaution. Attack may come at any time, in any place, without warning. Repeating the important facts from our previous reports, there is an aggressive force, an army, I suppose, of unexplained, unidentified, humanoid beings that has appeared in worldwide proportions. And these beings are totally aggressive 
and irrational in their violence. Civil defense efforts are underway, and investigations as to the origin and purpose of the aggressors are being conducted. All citizens are urged to take utmost cautionary measures to defend against the insidious alien force. These beings are weak in physical strength. They are easily distinguishable from humans by their deformed appearance. They are usually unarmed, but appear capable of handling weapons. They have appeared, but not led, an organized army. Not with any apparent reason or plan. Indeed, they seem to be driven with the urges of entranced or obsessed minds. They appear totally unthinking. They can, I repeat, they can be stopped by immobilization. That is, blind them or dismember them. They are, on the average, weaker in strength than an adult human. But their strength is in numbers, in surprise, and in the sheer fact that they are beyond our normal realm of understanding. They appear to be irrational, non-communicative beings, and they are definitely to be considered our enemies. We are at war. At this, Barbara bolted from the couch in wild, screaming hysteria. She ran blindly towards the front door. The truck driver appeared at the top of the stairs. Startled, unslinging the gun, he leapt down the stairs. Barbara was clawing at the barricade, trying to break out of the house. She was sobbing in wild desperation. He is almost upon her now, as she writhes out of his reach running across the room towards the maze of heaped up furniture. Suddenly, from within the maze, strong hands grab her. She screamed in terror. Truck driver rushed towards her, but he was startled by the sight of the other man who was trying to contain the hysterical girl. Behind him, an older man stood holding a length of pipe at his side. He had come through the door that the truck driver had tried and fell unlocked. The man holding Barbara was dressed in coveralls. He was probably a farmer, but he is big and powerful looking. The man holding Barbara began speaking. My name is Tom. Please calm down. It's all right. We're from the gas station. We're not. Barbara sagged against him and sobbed sporadically, in shock and semi-relief. She was both catatonic and hysterical. The elder man rushed to the radio. The truck driver just stared dumbly as Tom calmed down the girl and led her to a chair where she sat very still, numb now from her expended emotion. The radio voice continued with its information about the emergency. The elder man, who introduced himself as Harry Tinsdale, crouched close to the radio, still holding his length of pipe radio voice began speaking again. There have been periodic reports as information reaches this newsroom, as well as survival information and a listing of Red Cross rescue points. Pickups will be made as often as possible with the equipment and staff presently available. The truck driver stood staring at the two new men. He exuded an air of resentment, as though the strangers have intruded on his private fortress. Why, man, I... Tom interrupted him. It looks like you've got things pretty well locked in. The truck driver remained aggressive. Man, I could have used some help. How long have you guys been in there? Harry responded. That's the cellar. It's the safest place. The truck driver said, Man, you mean you didn't hear the racket we were making up here? How are we supposed to know what was going on? Said Harry could have been those things for all we knew. A girl was screaming, said the truck driver. Now you know what a girl sounds like. Those things don't make noise. Anybody's got to know there's somebody up here that can use some help when a girl screams like that. Tom tried to calm him down. You can't really tell what's going on from down there. Mary responded. We thought we could hear screams, okay? But that might have meant 
Those things might have been in the house after her. The truck driver remained angry. He wouldn't have come up and helped. Tom felt ashamed now. Well, I... If there was more of us... That racket sounded like the place was being ripped apart. How are we supposed to know? Now wait just a minute, said the truck driver. You said it was hard to hear down there. And now you say it sounded like the place was being ripped apart. You better get your story straight, mister. Harry interrupted him. All right. We're sorry. I'm not going to take those kind of chances when we have a safe place. We look into a safe place. And you're telling us to risk our lives just because somebody needs help? Yes, the truck driver. Exactly that, yes. Tom didn't know whose side to take. He spoke quietly. Can we just settle this now? We're up here now. We're here. Everything's okay. Now I suggest we all go back downstairs before any of those things find out we're in here. I can't get in here, said the truck driver. You mean you've boarded the whole place up? asked Tom. The truck driver's attitude softened a little. Most of it. Everything but the upstairs. It's weak in places, but it won't be hard to fix it up. No, said Harry. You're insane. The cellar is the safest place in the house. Those things turned over our car, man. We were lucky to get away at all. And now you tell me you don't think they can get through a pile of want. Tom interrupted Harry. His wife and kid are downstairs. The kid is badly tore up. This statement took the truck driver completely by surprise. His face softened. He exhaled a deep breath. Nobody said anything for a long moment. When the truck driver spoke, he could strengthen up these barricades. And with all of us working together, we could fix this up so nothing can get in here. And we got food, the fire, and we've got the radio. Harry shook his head. We can bring all of those things downstairs with us. Man, you're crazy. We got a million windows up here. All these windows, you're going to make them strong enough to keep them out. Look, man, responded the truck driver. Those things don't have any strength. I smashed three of them. I pushed another one out the door. Harry was shaking his head again. I'm telling you, they turned our car onto its roof. Yeah, but any good five men could do that, said the truck driver. That's my point, said Harry. Only there's not going to be five. There's not going to be ten, twenty, thirty, a hundred. Maybe, you know, once they know we're in here, the place will be crawling with them and we'll be overrun. Truck driver threw up his hands. Well, if there's that many, they're going to get us wherever we're at. Look, said Harry. In the cellar, there's only one door, all right. Only one. That's the only place we have to protect. And Tom and I fixed it, so it locks and boards from the inside. But all these doors and windows. Why, we'd never know where they were going to hit us next. The truck driver was still angry with Harry's suggestion to stay in the cellar. But he did agree. He said, You do have a point, Harry. But down in the cellar, there's no place to run. I mean, if they do get in, there's no back exit, and we'd be done for. Tom was nodding in agreement. Yes, we could get out of here if we had to, and we could see what's going on outside. Down there, there aren't any windows. If a rescue party does come, we'd never even know it. The window's up here. Harry was upset. But the cellar is the strongest place. The truck driver cut him off. No, the upstairs is just as much a trap as the cellar. There's three rooms up there, and they have to be boarded up like this stuff down here. And if they do get into the windows, they can't get past the doors. 
and they're weak. We can keep them out. See, I've got this gun now, and I didn't have it before. And I still need three of them off. Now, we might have to try and get out of here ourselves. Because there's no guarantee that anybody is going to send help. Suppose those things come in here. We can't even bust out of the cellar. So we open that door, and they got us. Tom shook his head. I don't know, but I think he's right, Harry. He turned towards the truck driver. How many do you think are out there? I figure maybe six or seven, he responded. Harry spoke up. Look, you two can do whatever you like, but I'm going back down to the cellar. But you better decide, because I'm going to board it up and I'm not going to be crazy enough to unlock it again, no matter what happens to you. Now wait just a minute, said Tom. Let's think about this for a while. No, nope, said Harry. I've made my decision. You make yours, and you can stew in your own juice. Tom was angry at this. Now wait a minute, Harry. Let's think about this a while. We can make it into the cellar if we have to. And if we do decide to stay down there, then we will need some things from up here anyway. Now let's at least consider this for a while. He walked purposely towards the windows and peered out through an opening in the barricade. Yeah, it looks like six or eight, he said. His hands went to his temples and he rubbed them nervously. His demeanor was a little shaken. The truck driver joined him at the window. Now wait a minute. That's more than there was before. There's a bunch out the back, too. His eyes moved towards the kitchen. That is, unless they're the same ones that was back there. He ran towards the kitchen. He flung his rifle over his shoulder, but the fringe started to break and the weapon started to fall. He twisted to keep it on his back and tried to grab it reaching behind. His attention on the gun. He does not see the door as he moves towards it. He regained control of the gun and looked up and stopped cold. Hands are reaching through the broken glass behind the barricades. Braying, rotting hands, scratching, reaching, trying to grab. And through aspects of the glass, the inhuman faces behind the hands. The barrier is being strained. No doubt about that. But it is holding well enough for now. He smashes with the rifle butt against the ugly extremities, pounding once, twice. One of the grabbing hands is driven back with the shattering of the already broken glass it was reaching through. The rifle butt smashes one of the hands against the door. Solidly the hand, one feeling of pain, continues to claw after a hole. He slid his finger to the trigger and turned the rifle, smashing the barrel through another of the little broken glass areas, and two of the gray hands sees protruding metal. A dead face appears behind the hand. It is ugly, expressionless. His face looks directly through the opening into the dead eyes beyond. The truck driver struggles desperately to control the weapon. But the zombie thing outside is trying to pull it away by the barrel. There is a brief instant when the muzzle points directly at the hideous face. Blam. The report shatters the air. The lifeless thing is thrown back, propelled by the blast. Its head torn partially away, but still outstretched hand, falling back with the crumbling body. The other hands continue to clutch and grab. Tom is rushed to the kitchen now, and Harry is standing cautiously, a feet from the doorway, still in the dining area. A distant voice, that of Harry's wife, suddenly begins to cry out from the cellar. Harry. Harry, are you all right? She called. It's all right, Helen, he responded. 
Everything's all right. Tom immediately rushed to the door. The truck driver is pounding at a hand that is trying to work at the barricade from the bottom. The blows seem ineffectual as the hand, oblivious except from the physical jouncing, continues to grab. Tom leapt against the door and grabbed the rotting wrist with both of his hands. He tried to bend the wrist back in an effort to break it, but it seems limp and almost pliable. Disgust sweeps over the young man's face. He tried to scrape the cold thing against the edge of the broken glass. The absence of blood is immediately evident as the sharp edge rips into what looks like rotting flesh. Another hand grabs at Tom's wrist and tries to pull it through the glass. Tom yells, and the truck driver tries to swing the barrel of the gun towards the thing struggling with Tom. But another hand clutches at him, even as he is trying to help the younger man. The hand is clawing and ripping his shirt. He focuses his attention on aiming the gun. Another loud blast. The hands Tom was fighting jerk back. And fall into the darkness. Put against the wall, the truck driver forces himself away from the door and out of the grasp of the hand, still clutching his shirt. The shirt tears away, and the thing backs off, still with the fragment in its hand. Badly shaken, Tom just stared. The truck driver took careful aim again and pulled the trigger. Blast rips through the thing's chest, leaving a gaping hole in its back. And yet, it remains on its feet, backing slowly away. Tom is moaning now. Oh no, what are these things? Panicked at the failure of the weapon, the truck driver levels off again. There is another loud report. This time the shell rips through the thing's thigh just below the pelvis. The thing backs away, but as it tries to put weight on its right leg, it falls into a heap. Two men stare in disbelief. The thing is still moving away, dragging itself with its arms and pushing against the ground with its remaining leg. What are these things? Tom mumbled. The truck driver wetted his lips took a deep breath and held it. Carefully sighted down the barrel of the rifle again. He pulled the trigger. The shell seemed to blow open the skull of the crawling form, and it fell backwards. These things are from hell, he said. His voice was trembling, and he let out his held breath. Outside, the thing that has fallen limply Without the use of its eyes, moves its arms, groping, clutching motion, seemingly still trying to drag itself away. Dylan was shouting from the cellar, Harry, Harry, are you okay? After a moment of silence, the truck driver turned from the door and started gathering supplies to fix the boards, and Harry began speaking. You're crazy. Those things are going to be at every door and window in the place. We've got to get to the cellar. The big truck driver turns towards Harry with absolute fury in his eyes. His voice was deeper in his rage and more commanding now. Then go. Get out of here, he said. Go to your cellar. Shouting stops Harry for an instant. And his adamancy returns. He has decided that he will go into the cellar without the others if need be. He is now prepared to gather his supplies. I'm taking the girl with me, he said, nodding towards Barbara. He moved towards the refrigerator in the kitchen. The truck driver stepped in front of him. You keep your hands off her, he said. She's staying here with me. Harry stopped again for a moment. But then he moved towards the refrigerator truck driver was angry. And don't you touch none of that food. His grip was still on his gun, and he's menacing now. Now if I stay up here, he said, I'm gonna be fighting for what's up here. 
and that food and that radio and all of this is what I'm fighting for. And you are stone dead wrong. You're just wrong. You understand? Now, if you're making it to the cellar, get moving. Go down these stairs and get out of here. And don't mess with me anymore. Harry turned towards Tom. This man is crazy. He's crazy. We've got to have food down there. We have a right. The truck driver was mad. This is your house, then? Harry stumbled over his words. But we've got a right. The truck driver turned towards Tom. Are you going down there with him? Tom just cowered his head. The truck driver spoke again. There's no beating around the bush. You go and arrange you. This is your last chance. There was a long moment of silence. And then Tom turned towards the older man. Harry, I think he's right. I really think we're better off up here. Harry was upset. You're crazy, Tom. You're crazy. I got a kid down there. Can't take all the racket. And those things reaching through the glass will be lucky if he lives, as it is now, and you know it. The truck driver was more impersonal than ever before. Okay, fine, he said. Now you're his father. If you're dumb enough to go die in the trap, that's your business. I ain't dumb enough to go with you. It's just bad luck for the kid, but his old man's so dumb. Now get down at the cellar. You can be boss down there. And I'm boss up here. And you ain't taking none of this food. You ain't taking nothing. Harry, Tom implored. We can get food to you. And if you want to stay down there. And... I don't know. Harry was upset. Shook his head angrily. Ellen kept screaming his voice from the cellar. Harry. Harry. Harry looked towards the cellar door and looked back at the two men and then quickly moves towards the door. You know, I won't open the door again, and I mean it, he said. They can fix us up here, said Tom. With your help, we could. No, said Harry. I think you're both nuts. And you don't have my help. The truck driver turned towards Tom. Let him go, man. His mind is made up. Just let him go. Harry looked at both for a moment, then lunged for the cellar door. He opened it and slammed it behind him. The sounds of his footsteps going down the stairs were as loud as possible. Tom rushed towards the door. Harry, wait. We'd be better off up here. The truck driver began reloading his gun, replacing the spent shells, and fixed the broken fringe back onto the rifle. Tom shouted through the door. Harry, if we stick together, man, we can fix it up real good. There are places we can run to up here. There are sounds now of Harry boarding up the door. The truck driver strapped the gun to his shoulder and turned and moved towards the upstairs. In passing, his glance falls on Barbara. He stepped backward off the stairs and looked at her. The radio has taken up again with the monotonous recorded message. Tom was still calling out to Harry. Harry, come on. We'd be better off if all three of us was working together. There are sounds of Harry barricading the door. We'll let you have food when you need it. He glanced warily at the truck driver, half expecting reprisal for this. And if we knock those things, they might be chasing us, and you could let us in. Barricading sounds stop. Footsteps can be heard as Harry walks down the cellar steps. Tom listens for a while, then retreats, disappointed and worried about the lack of Harry's efforts. There are many defensive measures that lie ahead. 
truck driver is with Barbara now, stooping beside her chair. She stared into an unseeing void. The truck driver softened at seeing her. Hey now, girl. Hey. She brushed her hair back from her eyes. Tears were welling up, and it almost seemed as though she might acknowledge his tenderness, but she did not. The truck driver felt very sorrowful, almost as he would feel for his child when he was sick. He massaged his forehead and eyes, tired from fear and exertion of the past hours. He meant to cover the girl with a coat, then stepped away and fed the fire. He started gently to blaze good and warm. The primary concern in this effort is for Barbara. Behind him, Tom walks up, and the truck driver senses his presence. Harry's wrong, man, he said. Tom remained silent. I'm not boxing myself in down there, no how, the truck driver said. He finished with the fire and rose to go upstairs. He might be here several days. We'll get it fixed up. He'll come up eventually. He ain't gonna stay down there very long. Don't wanna see what's going on. Or maybe, if we get a chance to get out, I'll come up then. He turned and walked towards the stairs. The cellar, with its dark gray walls and dusty clutter, it seemed cold and damp. Cardboard cartons tied with cord and hanging bird of pipe all looked dirty in the subdued light of the bare white bulb. The cartons take up most of the space. They vary in size from grocery boxes with faded brand names, large packing grates, and might have contained furniture. A washing machine, an old roller type, sits off in a corner of the cellar near a makeshift shower stall. Lines for drying clothes are strung over the pipework so low that Harry has to duck under them as he walks from the stairs to the other side of the confining quarters. Harry's wife, Helen, is at the faucet over the tubs, wetting a cloth with cold water. She looks up as Harry enters but is more interested in what she is doing at the moment. She wrings out the cloth and takes it to her young boy, her son, lies motionless atop a homemade work table. On a pegboard above the table are hanging tools and cables, and built into the table itself are drawers that probably contain smaller tools, screws and bolts, and washers. The woman moves a little stiffly. She is wearing a dress and a sweater, while a warmer coat is spread on the table under the boy. Its sides are flopped up and over him, covering his legs and chest. Ellen bends over her son and wipes his head with her cool cloth. Harry walks quietly up behind her. He is concentrated on caring for the boy, she pulls the coat more securely around him. He has a fever, she said. There's two more people upstairs, responded Harry. She's primarily concerned with the boy's comfort, but she asks, two people. Yeah, said Harry. There was a long pause, and he's somewhat defensive. I wasn't about to take any unnecessary chances. Ellen remained silent. Harry nervously reached to his breast pocket for a cigarette, produced an empty bag, and, seeing that it is empty, rumbles it in his hand and pitches it onto the floor. He steps over to the work table where there is another bag, snatches it up, and it too is empty. With the same crumpling action, he discards his bag. Violently this time, the action spinning him into position, facing his wife and boy. She continued to quietly swab the boy's forehead. Harry stared at them for a moment. They seemed to be all right, 
Now in a silence. The boy is motionless. He is sweating to the point where beads of sweat are formed all over his face. Harry waits and, seeing no answer forthcoming, changes the subject. They're all staying upstairs. They're idiots. We should stick together, and it's safest down here. He went to his wife's purse and rummaged through its contents. He pulled out a pack of cigarettes, ripped the pack open, and fumbled for a cigarette. He lit it and took a deep drag. This makes him cough slightly. They don't stand a chance up there. They can't hold those things off forever. There's too many ways they can get into the house. Helen remained silent. On the floor, next to the workbench, is a small transistor radio. Harry's glance falls on it, and he takes it, looking it on. You know, they've had a radio upstairs. Must have been civil defense. Or, I think it's not just us. I think this is happening all over. Radio picks up nothing but static. Harry plays with the tuning dial, listening anxiously. But across the receiving band, the transistor just hisses. Harry holds the radio up and turns it into various positions, trying for reception. This darn thing, he says. There is still a static. Helen stopped wiping the boy's forehead and neatly folded the cloth, draping it over her son's brow. She gently placed her hand on the boy's chest and looked over towards her husband. He moved impatiently around the cellar, the cigarette dangling from his lip, waving the little radio round in the air for reception. The radio was just emitting static at varying levels. Harry, said Helen. He continued fidgeting with the radio. He went near the walls and the stairs, holding an eye and still spinning the dial. Harry, Helen repeated. That thing can't pick up anything. We're in a dungeon. A rising tone of voice stopped him, and he turned and looked at her. He was about to cry. Harry felt himself overcome with anger. He could not think of words to say. His face was twitching. His emotion searching for some vehicle or expression. And he suddenly pivoted violently and flung the radio across the room. He began shouting. I hate you, right? I hate the kid. I want to see you die here, right? In this stinking place. My goodness, Helen. Do you realize what's happening? Those things are all over the place. They'll kill us all. I enjoy watching my kids suffer like this. I enjoy seeing all this happen. Helen's head jerked towards him. She looked at him with what was almost vengeance. She spoke. He needs help, Harry. We might die here. We have to get out of here. We have to find a way, Harry. Harry shook his head in anger. Oh, yeah. Let's just walk out. We can pack up right now and get ready to go. And I'll just say to those things, Excuse me. My wife and kids are uncomfortable here. We're going into town. Helen. There's maybe 20 of those things out there. And there's more every minute. She began to cry. There's people upstairs. We should stick together, you said. Are we fighting with them? Upstairs, downstairs. What's the difference? Maybe they can help us. Let's get out of here. Let's go upstairs. Let's do something. Let's get out of here, Harry. Pounding sound interrupted her. They listened. The sound was coming from the door at the top of the stairs. Harry, shouted Tom, and more pounding. Harry just stared up at the door, 
did not answer Tom's call. Tears welled up in Helen's eyes, more pounding. Helen looked at Harry, but he did not respond. She got up and went towards the stairs. Yes, yes, Tom, what do you need? Harry ran after her, grabbing her shoulders from behind. Harry, Harry, it's Tom, said Helen. Tom shouted through the door. Hey, Harry, we got food and some medicine and things up here. Harry stared up at the door, speechless. Tom said again, There's going to be a thing on the radio in ten minutes. Harry, a civil defense thing. They'll tell us what to do. Helen looked up at the door and shouted, We're coming up, Tom. We'll be up in a minute. Harry said, you're out of your mind, Helen. All it takes is one minute. Those things get in up there, and it's too late to change your mind. Don't you see that? Can't you see that we're safe as long as we keep that door sealed up? Harry, you're so wrong, said Helen. I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. I want to get out of here go upstairs, see if someone will help us. Maybe Karen will be okay. Shouting stopped, and she took control over herself. She stepped towards Harry and spoke in a calmer tone, almost pleading. Harry, please, for just one minute, we'll go up and we'll see what's up there. Hear the radio and maybe we can figure out some way out of here. Maybe with all of us, we can make it, Harry. Harry, his adamancy weakening somewhat, took a cigarette from his mouth, exhaling the last puff, and dropped it to the floor. He rubbed it out with his foot. Smoke came in a long stream through his first lips. Tom was shouting again. Harry, hey, Harry. Ben found a television upstairs. Come on up. We'll see the civil defense broadcast on TV. Soothingly, the Harry. Helen changed her tone. Really, be honest. Harry must feel in going against his original decision. Come on. Let's go upstairs. There'll be something on TV that tells us what to do. You can tell them I wanted to come up. Harry's voice was gruff. All right. This is your decision. We'll go up. But don't blame me if we all get killed. Her eyes fell away from his. She led as they went up the stairs. The cellar door swung open. Helen and Harry stepped together into the hallway. Faltering, they peered through the entranceway into the living room. Harry, standing beside his wife, was hostile, partially due to anger with himself because he reneged on his decision about the cellar. Helen, too, was overwrought. She was anxious, and her eyes darted everywhere. He saw only Tom and Barbara in the living room, and Barbara, overcome with nervous exhaustion, was sleeping fitfully on the couch. Tom spoke. We can see the broadcast, I think, if the TV works. I have to go help Ben. Helen went to Barbara, looked down at her sympathetically, and brushed her hair, pulling the overcoat over her shoulders. Or I think, she said. She must have been through a lot. During these moments, Harry has been anxiously flitting around the house, from door to window, the kitchen, living room, checking out the actual degree of security, and he worried about the imminence of attack at any second. Ellen, said Tom, I think her brother was killed out there. Ben was yelling from upstairs, somewhat upset. Tom, hey Tom, are you going to give me a hand with this thing? Tom was startled, aware of his procrastination. 
and bolted for the upstairs to help Ben. Harry paused momentarily in his anxiety and came to sit where his wife was, near Barbara. Ellen spoke. Her brother was killed. This place is ridiculous, Helen, said Harry. There's a million weak spots up here. There were sounds from upstairs of Tom and Ben struggling with the television set. They are making their way down the steps. I don't care, said Helen. There's people up here. Why don't you do something to help somebody? But Harry, not really hearing her, was staring once more into the gloom outside. I can't see anything out there, he said. There could be 50 million of those things. I can't see a thing. That's how much good these windows do us. Then the truck driver, who with Tom has reached the landing with the heavy television set, has heard the last part of Harry's remark. He glowered, even as he moved with his end of the burden said nothing. He and Tom gingerly deposited the TV in the center of the room. They hunted for an outlet, found one, and slide and walk the set until the cord was close enough to be plugged in. Then kneeled behind the set to plug in the cord. Harry spoke. Wake that girl up. There's going to be a thing on the TV. She might as well know where she stands. I don't want anybody's life on my hand. Harry, said Helen. Stop acting like a child. The truck driver was on his feet now. I don't want to hear anything more from you, mister. You stay up here. You'll take your orders from me. And that includes leaving the girl alone. She needs rest. Now we're just going to let her sleep it off, you understand? And nobody's going to touch her unless I say so. Ben stared Harry down for at least a moment, to ascertain that he was at least temporarily silenced, and his hand plunged immediately to the television set. He turned it on, and the occupants of the room jockeyed for vantage points, and they are baited for a few seconds of dead silence as they all waited to see whether the TV would warm up. All eyes were on the TV. A hiss began, increasing in volume. Then cranked the volume all the way up. A glowing band spread, filling the screen. It's on, said Helen. There are murmurs of excitement and anticipation. The TV only shows nothing. No picture, no sound just the glow and hiss of the screen. Ben's hand races the tuning dial through the clicks, the various stations. Stay with the rabbit ears, said Harry. We might be able to get something. Ben bust with horizontal and vertical, with brightness and contrast. On one station, he finally got sound. He adjusted the volume. Pitcher tumbled around. He played with it for a moment, until finally bringing it in. The whole screen was a commentator in the middle of a news report. People in the room settled back to listen. Authorities assigned little credibility to the theory that this onslaught is the product of mass hysteria. Authorities advised utmost caution until the menace could be brought under absolute control. Eyewitness accounts have been investigated and documented. Corpses of vanquished aggressors are presently being examined by medical pathologists, but autopsy efforts have been hampered by the mutilated condition of these corpses. Security measures instituted in metropolitan areas include enforced curfews and safety patrols by armed personnel. Citizens are urged to remain in their homes. Those who ignore this warning expose themselves to intense danger from the aggressors themselves and from armed citizenry whose impulse may be to shoot first and ask questions later. During the telecast, there are mixed feelings and reactions, but these responses were sporadic and infrequent. 
predominant mood of all involved is to learn as much as possible from the telecast. TV commenter continued. Rural or otherwise isolated dwellings have most frequently been the object of frenzied, concerted attacks. Isolated families are in extreme danger. Escape attempts should be made in heavily armed groups, by motor vehicle if possible. Phrase your situation carefully before deciding about an escape tactic. Fire is an effective weapon. These beings are highly flammable. Escape groups should strike out for the nearest urban community. And defense outposts have been established on major arteries leading into all community. These outposts are equipped to defend refugees and to offer medical and surgical assistance. Police and vigilante groups are in the process of combing remote areas in search and destroy missions, seeking all aggressors. These patrols are attempting to evacuate isolated families. The rescue efforts are proceeding slowly due to the increased danger of nightfall and the sheer enormity of the task. Rescue, for those in isolated circumstances, is highly undependable. You should not wait for a rescue party unless there is no possibility of escape. If you are few against many, you will most certainly be overcome. The aggressors are irrational and demented. Their sole urge is the quest for human flesh. Sheriff Conan W. McClellan of the County Department of Public Protection was interviewed minutes after he and his vigilante patrol had vanquished several of the aggressors. We bring you now the results of that interview. TV faded and segued to a videotape interview. It was a wide shot, a night scene, and swords. Posted guards maintained the periphery of a small clearing. Radic gunfire was heard in the distance. Some of the men were smoking, some talking in groups. The area was illuminated by a large bonfire. Sheriff McClelland was the vocal figure, so that as he talks, we catch glimpses of his activity in the background. He was shouting commands, supervising defense measures, and the burning of the bodies. At the same time, he was trying to answer reporters' questions. McClellan was pacing around, not straying too far. The crackle of the bonfire, the shouts and the bustle of activity we constantly heard behind his commentary. As he talks, he frequently turns away, his primary concern being his efforts in dealing with the aggressors and controlling his search party. Yeah, well, he said, this is rough country for an evening I He smiled. But things aren't going too badly. Men are taking it pretty well. We killed 19 of them today, right around this general area. These last three we found trying to claw their way into an abandoned mine shed. There was nobody in there. But these things just pounding and clawing, trying to bust their way in. It's funny in a way, he continued. They must have thought there was people in there. We heard the racket and came and blasted them down. What's your opinion then, asked a reporter. Can we defeat these things? Leland responded. There ain't no problem. The only problem is whether we can get to them before they kill off all of these people. Me and my men can handle them okay. We haven't lost anybody or suffered any casualties. All you gotta do is shoot for the eyes. You can tell anybody out there. All you gotta do is draw a sharp bead shoot for the eyes, or beat them down and lock their heads off. Oh, well, okay, said the reporter. Then I'd have a decent chance, even if I was surrounded by two or three of them. Llewellyn responded, If you had yourself a club or a good torch, you could hold them off or burn them to death. We 
Catch fire like nothing. Both like wax paper. But the best thing is to shoot for the eyes. Only for us to rescue you. As if they get you too far outnumbered. You've had it. We're doing our best. We only got so many men. And a whole lot of open country to comb. The reporter stopped him. But do you think you can bring these things under control? Really? McClellan responded. We got things in our favor now. It's only a question of time. We aren't for certain how many of them there are. But we know that when we find them, we're able to kill them. So it's a matter of time. They are weak. But there's pretty many of them. So don't wait for no rescue party. Arm yourself to the team. Get together in a group. And try and make it to a rescue station. That's the best way. But if you're alone, you gotta set up stock still. Wait for help. But I promise you, we'll try to let it go to get there. Or they do. The TV screen began to fade, segueing back to a live announcer. McClellan emphasizing his point, even as the scene faded out. Tell him to shoot for the eyes. Tell them. The commentator's voice could be heard again. I've heard Sheriff Conan W. McClellan, the County Department of Public Protection. This is your civil defense emergency network, with reports every hour, on the hour, for the duration of this emergency. Remain in your home. Keep all doors and windows locked. Do not under any circumstance. Everyone looked angrily towards Ben, who had clicked off the television. Why'd you turn it off? asked Tom. The man said they only come on every hour, responded Ben. We heard all we need to know. We gotta get out of here. I agree, said Helen. The man said the rescue stations have doctors and medical supplies. If we could get there, they could help Barbara. Harry Scott. How are we gonna bust out of here? We got a sick kid and two women. One of them out of her head. And three men. There's a million of them out there. Tom shook his head. Miller should have a checkpoint there. About 17 miles from here. Ben grew excited at this. Are you from here? Do you know this area? Yeah, responded Tom. I was working in the cemetery across the road. I'm the caretaker. Two of those things attacked me, and I hightailed it over here. Found everybody wiped out. Not too long after, these other people fought their way in. I was scared, but I opened the basement door and let them in. Unbeknownst to everybody, Barbara has been sitting up listening, and now she speaks, startling them and gathering their attention. She has come down from her hysteria, but is very weak. You work in the cemetery? She asked. My brother is over there. Oh, you poor thing, said Helen. My boy is hurt, too. We have to get to that rescue station. The television told us. We have to try and escape. There he was speaking. Well, I think we ought to stick right here and wait for a rescue party. He said if you're few against many, you don't have a chance. We can't tramp 17 miles through those things. Ben interrupted. We ain't got to tramp. My truck's right outside the door. I stopped Harry. There was a moment of silence. Ben said again. But I'm just about out of gas. There's a pump near the shed outside. But it's locked. Tom was becoming more enthused, seeing the possibilities. The key ought to be around somewhere. There's a big key ring in the basement, and the keys are labeled and bolted for the cellar. Is there a fruit cellar? asked Ben. Yeah, 
Why? said Harry. We're going to need lots of jars, said Ben. We can make Molotov cocktails, scare those things back, and fight our way to the pump and gas up the truck. But we're going to need kerosene, said Tom. Actually, there's a jug of that in the basement, too. Barbara and I can help, said Helen. We can rip up sheets and things. Harry was heard clomping up from the cellar. Here's the key ring. The bump key is marked with a piece of tape. Good, said Ben. That settles that question. We should take a crowbar anyway, in case the key doesn't work. The crowbar can double as a weapon for whoever goes with me. But I don't want to get all the way out there and find the pump won't open. We'll go, said Tom. You and me can fight our way to the pump. The women can stay in the cellar and take care of the kids. We should also have a stretcher. Barbara and Helen, you can do that. Hurry, said Ben. You're going to have to guard the upstairs. Once we inboard the door, those things can get in here easy. But me and Tom have to get in too after we get back here with the truck. You've got to guard the door and unlock it for us. And we'll board it up as fast as we can because those things are going to come fast on our heels. We don't get back. Well then, you'll be able to see from upstairs. And you can barricade the door again and go to the basement. You can sit down there and wait for the rescue party. Well, I want a gun then, said Harry. That's the best thing for me to use. You're not going to have time to stop and aim. Ben was adamant. I'm keeping this gun. Nobody else lays a hand on it. I found it. And it's mine. Really, said Harry. You don't care what happens to us. How do we know you and Tom won't just take the truck and cut out of here? Ben was glowering now with controlled anger. That's the chance you'll have to take. If we cut out, you'll still have your basement. Like you've been crying about all along. Ellen cut in. We're going to die here if we don't all work together. My brother's out there, said Barbara. Maybe we can get him and bring him back. He's just wounded. He'll be okay. Helen was understanding. That's okay, honey. We'll be all right. Maybe your brother will be too. Let's get busy then, said Ben. We've got a lot to do if we're going to bust out of here. He was on his feet now, taking command. The scene fades out and fades into a new scene. Completion of escape preparation. Tom was pouring kerosene into fruit jars. Helen was dipping twisted rag fuses in kerosene in the bottom of a dish. Barbara comes out from the kitchen with more jars, drying them on the outside and putting them on the table. She and Helen began working the kerosene soaked fuses through the holes which Tom has cut in the jar lid. Between them is a crude stretcher made of broomsticks and torn sheets. The television is off. The radio drones lowly, repeating the recorded message. The radio is on as a monitor only. But they may work and still keep up with news that may affect their situation. Barbara began speaking. I don't know what to think about my brother. We have to get out of here. Maybe we'll find him in Willard. Maybe he was able to crawl to the car and get away. No, said Helen. We have to think of ourselves now. It's hard for you. But that's all we can do. My boy is getting worse, too. I have to get him to a doctor. Harry came over and checked the stretcher, making sure the straps would hold. Broomsticks and belt buckles, he said, and old sheets. It seems to hold okay. But I always hated the Boy Scouts. It'll be okay, said Tom. Is there anything open upstairs? There are some windows in the room, said Harry. Ben is unfastening the doors now. All right, said Tom. We'll throw the cocktails from upstairs. Just splash the whole area with them. That should keep most of them away while we make a break for the truck. We're ready, said Helen. Here comes Ben now. Ben, 
gun strapped around his back. He was carrying a crowbar and a claw hammer. He walked around checking preparations, smiled at Barbara, glad to see she was doing a little better. Things are ready up there, said Ben. Now me and Tom will unboard the front door. Harry, you'll take the two women upstairs. Carry the Molotov cocktails with you. As soon as the door is unboard, we can throw those things all over the place. Make sure they catch fire good. Then the women bust down here and get in the cellar. Don't forget the stretcher. When we hear your footsteps on the stairs, me and Tom will be gone. It'll be up to you, Harry. You've got to watch this door. Watch yourself a good length of pipe. I have a pitchfork, said Harry. All right, good. Okay, said Ben. Tom and Ben went over to the door. The others gathered the fruit jars and snuck quietly to the unboarded room upstairs. Tom and Ben were left alone. Tom was soaking a table leg in kerosene, ready to light it for use as a torch. They fall to work on the door. Painstaking work of quietly undoing the barricade. They do not want to give alarm to the lurking things outside. With crowbar and claw hammer, very carefully, both men working on each separate piece of lumber, they undo the barricade. Each nail creak is a menace. They are alert to the constant danger. They finish and watch, posting themselves anxiously by the door. Shadow figures lurk in the dark outside. Tom and Ben wait for the Molotov shower to begin. Suddenly, a cry is heard. A window flies open. The first fiery blaze light in the yard. Four follow, some aimed for the creatures themselves. One of two catch fire. The others start to back away. The entire field is lit up. Bombs shower from upstairs. Harry was shouting from upstairs, slamming the door to the room he was in. That's all, Ben. Run for it. His voice echoed as Tom and Ben burst into the yard. They were armed with torches and with the gun. They leapt into the truck. Tom plunged the torch into the chest of an attacker, who immediately caught fire and went down in a blaze, touching the torch. The truck started up and careened in a U-turn for the old shed. Attackers fell away as it started out. Ben aimed, firing several shots. Most miss as the truck jounces towards the gas pump across the yard. But one creature goes down at the front of the gas pump near the old shed. Tom and Ben leap out. Attackers are starting to make their way to them from across the yard. Tom fumbled with the key to the locked pump. Ben shoved him back. Hurriedly aimed the gun. The gun fired blowing the lock to pieces. Gas spurt all over the place. Creatures advanced. Gas was still spurting. Tom crammed the nozzle into the mouth of the gas tank in the back of the truck. Ben crouched and leveled off with his weapon. An approaching attacker went down, but more were coming. Tom's torch was inadvertently set fire to the douse truck. Flames begin to lick and spread. The attackers gathered in force, ever closer. Tom leaped into the flaming truck. It skid and lurched across the yard. Ben shouted, to no avail. The flaming truck sped away, driven by the panicked Tom. Several of the creatures were upon Ben now. He thrashed and pounded at them with his torch and gun. Tom ignored this, thinking that Ben had to try and fight his way back to the house. From inside the house, panicked and cowardly Harry has seen only pieces of the action. He has been darting back and forth from door to window, trying to see what has been happening outside. From his viewpoint, the escape attempt is met with total doom. He has seen the truck catch fire driven away by Tom. Ben appeared to be overwhelmed. 
Harry ran again to the door. He saw the truck, completely in flames, speeding away from the house toward the small rise. Back to the kitchen window. Ben was about to be overcome. There were things all around him. Harry could not see. But Tom jumped from the burning truck to be seized by the attacking ghouls. The truck continued unmanned over the far rise and exploded violently. The noise and flame shattered the night. Several ghouls are at the front door, trying to beat their way into the house. From inside, Harry was in complete terror. He could not hold out. All was lost. He panicked and bolted for the cellar. But Ben has managed to slug his way through the attackers on the porch. He is pounding for admission at the front door. He turned, and with a powerful lunge, kicked the last attacker off the porch. On the rebound, he plowed his shoulder against the door, and it crashed open, the lock now broken. He burst through in time to catch Harry at the cellar door, but there is no time. Ben frantically tried to reboard the door. His eyes met Harry's for an instant, and they both fall to work. They board up the door. They're temporarily safe. They turn and look towards each other, sweat streaming from each face. Harry knows what's coming. Ben's fist crashed against Harry's face. He is driven back, one punch following another until Ben cornered him, clenching his lapels against the wall. Ben's words spit out in anger, each word punctuated by an additional slam of Harry against the wall. You rot. Next time you try something like that, I'll kill you. Ben slammed him one final time. Harry slid down the wall, rumbling on the floor. His face was swollen. His streaming blood. Ben is at the cellar door and pounding. Come on up. It's us. It's all over. Tom is dead. The scene fades out. The survivors are gathered in the living room. Barbara and Helen are slumped on the sofa. The overwhelming mood, hopelessness, and despair is them all. Harry sulks in a corner, his head slung back, his face swollen. He was holding an ice pack against his eye. His good eye followed Ben, who was pacing about the room. When Ben's pacing took him to the kitchen, or to some area out of Harry's sight, the good eye nervously relaxed. Ben's movements make virtually the only sound. He was checking the defenses by force of old habit rather than hope. The rifle was slung on his back. For a long time, he walked around the scene with absolute dejectedness of everyone to the barricaded house on his shoulder. Ben paced from door to kitchen to the window. He started to go upstairs, stop, check himself, went to the door again. He looked at his watch. Ten minutes to three, he said. There'll be another broadcast in ten minutes. Nobody said anything. Ben pulled back the curtain, his eyes suddenly wide, but he watched for a long moment. There were many ghouls outside, lurking in the shadows of the hanging trees. Some of the things are in the open, much nearer to the house than they dared come before. Remains of charred bodies are dimly apparent in various parts of the lawn. Ben's eyes are fastened on a more grisly scene at the edge of the lawn. In the moonlight, several ghouls are devouring what was once Tom. They rip and tear into aspects of his body, ghoulish teeth, biting into Tom's arms and hands. Ben stared in fascination and repulsion. The convulsive movement 
His fingers release the curtain. They turn, shaken, and face the others. Beads of perspiration drip from his forehead. Don't, he said. Don't any one of you look out there. You won't like what you see. Harry's good eye fastened on Ben and watched him, satisfied and contemptuous to see the old big man weaken. Ben moved from the television and clicked it on. Barbara's scream pierced the room. Ben leapt back from the television. She is on her feet now, sobbing uncontrollably. We'll never get out of here, she said. None of us. We'll never get out of here alive. Not one of us. We're all going to die here. Johnny. Oh, Johnny. There's no one to help us. Before anyone could move to her, she choked up as suddenly as she began. And slumped, sobbing violently onto the couch. Her face buried in her hands. Ellen tried to soothe her. But great sobs came racking from deep within. She grew gradually quiet. The sobs diminished. She remained slumped on the couch, her face covered with her hand. Ellen covered her with the overcoat, but the action seemed futile. Barbara made no movement whatsoever, then allowed himself to sink very slowly into a chair in front of the TV. Harry's good eye followed Barbara to Ben. His eye fastened on the gun, which Ben lowered but first to the floor, then leaned against his legs. Ben threaded his arm through the fringe sling and maintained his grip on the four-piece. Harry watched closely. Helen stood up and announced, I'm going to the cellar to take care of our son. She bent over and placed her hand on Barbara. Come on, honey. Come and talk to me. It'll make me feel better. But Barbara made no response. Ellen turned and started for the cellar door. She had to squeeze past Harry's chair. Furtively, his eye on Ben. Harry touched her and pulled her towards him. She too watched Ben. She knew something was strange. Ben remained transfixed before the TV lost in thought, his mind drifting elsewhere. There was nothing on the screen, just a dull glow, a low hiss, or scanning lines and static. He has turned on the TV too early. Harry whispered cautiously to Helen, I've got to get that gun. We can go to the cellar. You have to help me. He has let the ice pack come away from his eye. He's swollen, blackened, and desperate. Ben still gazed at the TV, worried about the possibility that Ben might catch them in the act, not really sympathizing with Harry. Ellen pulled away, but she leaned close to Harry and whispered quickly, I'm not going to help you. Haven't you had enough? You'd kill us both, you know that. She went to the cellar, and on her way passed by Ben's chair. She hesitated, her eyes falling on the gun, noticing the sling was wound around Ben's arm. She stood still for a moment, looking. Then she went towards the cellar, and opened the door, and went down. As Helen reached the bottom of the cellar stairs, she looked up. And her face showed startlement, a shaken smile. Her son was sitting up, propped on his elbows on the workbench table. Helen started for him, but stopped. There was something strange. His face turned slowly towards her. There was a ghoulish look in his eyes. He was dead. He began to rise slowly. Terrifyingly, his features grotesque. The coat that was his blanket began to fall away. His eyes stared through Helen, 
and beyond her. Slowly, agonizingly, he raised himself from the table. Helen, terrified, began to back away across the cellar. Her hand found a knife. Her child crept towards her. She moved a large packing crate, trying to block her path, trying to stave the confrontation. But she was too late. He sprung. It appears as though the knife could be driven into his breast. But on the spring, he got to be upstairs, where, simultaneously, a scream pierces the room. An assault has begun. The things are beginning to break into the house. They've gotten into the den and are hammering at the barricaded door. The walls are starting to come apart. Ben was on his feet, trying to reinforce the barricades with hammer and crowbar. He worked furiously. Harry, he cried, get over here. Give me a hand. Harry came over behind Ben. But instead of helping gun from Ben's back. Holding the gun on Ben, Harry back towards the cellar. Ben turned around, panicked. The things were breaking into the house. What are you up to, man? asked Ben. You've got to keep those things out. Harry was backing away. Now we'll see who's going to shoot who. I'm going to the cellar, and you can rot up here. His hand went behind him to the cellar door. But at that moment, his ghoulish child leapt upon him with a great thud. It was at Harry's throat. Ben was able to grab the gun. He leveled off, trying to hit the kid. The sudden wrench of the two struggling bodies, Ben missed. Harry screamed. A great clot of blood appeared at his chest. He clutched the wound. He began to go down. He fell through the entranceway to the cellar stairs. He reeled, grabbing the banister, and began to descend. He began falling, reeling, head first down the stairs. Then, meantime, he swung the kid with one heave against the wall. But things have broken into the house. Everywhere, the barricades are coming apart. Barbara, the hysteria of revenge, has flung herself into the attack. She smashed a chair against one of the aggressors, and it went down. She smashed and smashed it on the floor until there was nothing left of the chair. She came up, still swinging, riding with Ben against the things that have come into the house. It was quite apparent that they could not hold out any longer. The attack raged. They were overwhelmed. Ben grabbed Barbara and pulled her after him towards the cellar. She was lashing and swinging, beating at an attacker even as he dragged her away. Ben flung open the door to the cellar, and Helen was at his throat. He brought the gun up between their struggling bodies until the muzzle was against her throat and squeezed the trigger. She was blown halfway across the room. Ben and Barbara ran down the stairs. Harry was sprawled in a pool of blood on the floor. He was dead and beginning to rise. Ben pushed Barbara back. She turned her head away. Ben raised the gun. Three evenly spaced shots ripped across the room. Ben was almost glad to kill Harry. He turned to Barbara breathing hard. She collapsed against him and began to sob. There was faint pounding against the barricaded cellar door. It is holding. Creatures cannot get in. It fades to black. There are sounds of birth. Fainter sounds of dogs. Human voices. It fades up quickly to sunrise. Morning after the siege, the sky is clear. The rising sun is bright and warm. There is dew on the high grass of a meadow. Men with dogs and guns 
are working their way up from the woods that surround the meadow. There's a posse. You can hear their sounds and shouts. Muffled talking, panting, straining of dogs against leashes. Sheriff McClellan's men. A few men, some with German shepherds on leashes, finally come out of the woods and onto the edge of the sunlit, dewy meadow. Wet grass has dampened the boots and trouser legs, all of the men. McClellan is perhaps the third man out from the surrounding thicket. He is a heavy man, mustached, breathing hard because of his weight and the difficult job of leading the posse through the night. He is armed with shotgun and pistol, and a belt of ammunition is strung over his shoulder. He paused, looking back into the woods, and mopped perspiration from his brow with a balled-up and dirty handkerchief. Come on, men, he said. Step lively now. Never can tell what we'll run into up here. He costed a man just climbing out of the wood. The man was wearing an improvised sweatband and carried a rifle and sidearm. He had a walkie-talkie strapped on his back. Hey, George, McClellan said. You could be in touch with the squad cars. George was breathing hard, adjusting the straps and burden across his back. Yeah, I know where we are. They should be intercepting us at the house. Good, said McClellan. These men are dog-tired. They can use some rest and hot coffee. He looked back, the men moving up from behind. Let's push along now. The squad cars will be waiting with coffee and sandwiches at the house. The men pushed across the field. Inside the house, Ben and Barbara been dozing on chairs in the basement and woke abruptly thinking he has heard something but he isn't sure he sat up and listened more closely and far off there was the sound of a dog and listened for a time but heard nothing more outside the meadow has become the apron of a cemetery but when Barbara and John had come to with flowers for their mother. The posse was advancing, threading its way among the grave markers. The man found John's skeletal remains near the spot where he had fallen. Down a dirt road, and up a short grade was Barbara's car, and a smashed window. Looks like this guy's car, said McClelland. Poor fellow, never had a chance. The men passed through the cemetery and over the wall, where several squad cars were waiting on the road. There were also one or two motorcycle patrolmen. One of the men dismounted and hailed McClellan. Hey, sir, how are things going, he asked. McClellan advanced and shook hands, stopping a while, mopping his brow again. The men began to catch up and regroup. Sure glad to see you, fellas, said McClellan. We've been at it all night, but I don't want to break until we get to the house over there. We might be lollygagging around while somebody needs our help. We'll see first, then stop and get some coffee. Anything you say, said the patrolman. Inside the house, Ben has snuck at the top of the cellar stairs and listened there very intently. Not wanting to open the door, his creatures might still be in the house. This time, for sure, he heard gunshots, and the mumbled sound of what might be voices approaching. There was even what sounded like a car engine, then bolted excitedly down the stairs, waking the girl. Barbara! Barb! Honey! There's men outside. I can hear them. They must be here to rescue us. But outside... We see the cause of the gunshots. The men are flushing out bulls from the pump house and surrounding area. The squad cars have driven up. The men are advancing across the lawn, guardedly, towards the partially destroyed old farmhouse. The men crouch and sneak up slowly, keeping their eyes fastened on the house. A loud, sudden noise stops them. 
they watch, quiet in their tracks. Shoot for the eyes, boys, said McClellan. Like I told you before, always aim right for the eyes. Inside, ready to shoot or swing, Ben has slammed open the cellar door. The force of his shoulder against the door has carried him into the living room. There's nothing. Only the ramshackle and destruction from the recent siege. He edged his way the twisted wreckage and overturned furniture towards the front door. There was no light in the place. His hands found what was left of the curtain. He pulled it back and started to peer out. But a shot rang out. Ben reeled, driven back, a circle of blood on his forehead, right between his eyes. Barbara's scream is heard from downstairs. Simultaneously, McClellan shouts, his face flushed with anger. What did you shoot for? We're here to save the people in there. The man who fired the shot spoke. Now this place is demolished. There ain't nobody in there. Trollman spoke up. No, I'm sure I heard a girl scream. In the basement, maybe. Several men have advanced to kick in the front door. They step back and peered cautiously inside. Their faces searched the room. The path of sunlight from the open door fell partially on Ben. He was dead. The men looked down at him and stepped past him toward the cellar. They did not know he was the man. In the cellar, they hear muffled sobs. Alan entered and began to inch his way down the stairs. Hey, is anyone down there? He drew his pistol, inching his way down the stairs. At the bottom, he confronted Barbara, sitting wide-eyed in a chair. Alan raised his pistol, aimed it for her head, but something stopped him. A tear in her eye. He lowered the weapon. It's all right, men, he said. Come on down. There's a girl here. He went up to Barbara, bent over her, and began to help her stand. The scene cuts to outside, burning of bodies in the yard of the old house. Perhaps the burning of the house itself. In the background, against the scene of McClellan draping his jacket around Barbara and bringing coffee to her lips, we see Ben's body on a stretcher, carried by two men. They lift it into the rear of the station wagon. It's too bad, McClellan said. An accident. The only loss we had. The whole night. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.